This hearing will come to order, and before we begin, I'd like to welcome Representative John Curtis of Utah to the committee. And uh, he's a successful mayor and businessman, and he'll serve on the Subcommittee on Europe, Eurasia, and Emerging Threats, and on the Subcommittee on the Middle East and North Africa. So welcome, John. Today, uh, this hearing is on counterterrorism efforts in Africa, and we examine U.S. counterterrorism efforts uh, across the continent. This committee has long advocated for strong, sustained relations between the United States and the countries in Africa. And from the Electrify Africa Act and the reauthorization of the African Growth and Opportunity Act to end wildlife trafficking, we've worked on a bipartisan basis to provide the tools for greater engagement with a continent that is home to some of the world's fastest growing economies, but also some major security challenges. As I said in our May hearing on U.S. interests in Africa, for our efforts on the continent to succeed, we must help our partners confront the threat of radical Islamist terrorism, from al-Shabaab in Somalia to Boko Haram in northern Nigeria to al-Qaeda and ISIS in Libya, and their affili affiliates across the Sahel. Terrorists seek to destabilize governments by threatening vulnerable communities, often by exploiting local grievances. This committee and Congress as a whole has supported our uniformed men and women in this fight, including by voting last year to require a strategy to defeat Boko Haram. The death of four U.S. soldiers in Niger in early October and a Navy SEAL in Somalia last May are stark reminders to us of the danger inherent in these efforts. This is why the War Powers Resolution requires notification to Congress when forces equipped for combat are deployed abroad. AFRICOM is working with the FBI and other agencies on an investigation into what happened in Niger, which military officials expect to be completed in January. After the grieving families are briefed on the findings, Congress will be eager to ensure that appropriate steps are taken to lessen future risks to our forces. This hearing will take a broader look at U.S. counterterrorism efforts across Africa. While the Department of Defense often plays the most visible role in these efforts, the State Department is charged with developing the overall strategy. State also plays a significant role in security assistance, in providing countries like Niger with armored vehicles and other equipment that they need to confidently take the fight to the enemy. In recent years, DOD funding for security assistance in Africa has surpassed that provided by state. However, thanks to a bipartisan effort by this committee, most of these authorities now require State Department concurrence as well as joint development, joint planning, and joint implementation. Many also require efforts to bolster democratic values of partner forces, including civilian control of the military. Combating terrorism and building stability is as much a political as military challenge, so the State Department must lead on these efforts. It's important for members to understand that while successive administrations have used the 2001 AUMF to conduct strikes in Somalia and Libya, the majority of U.S. counterterrorism operations in Africa are carried out under other authorities that Congress has provided. Together, these, uh, as we call them, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and train and equip and advise and assist missions build the capabilities of our partner forces while helping them to take on current threats. Of course, military efforts alone cannot defeat radical ideology. Severe poverty, lack of education, Local grievances and weak governance provide the ideal context for this hateful ideology to take hold in the first place. As AFRICOM's first commander told the committee in May, 
It is in our best interest to focus on sustained development engagement just as we focused on sustained security engagement. That's a long-term commitment, but one in our security interest. And I look forward to hearing how both departments are working to support the development of strong, resilient African governments that deny terrorist groups room to grow. And let me turn now to our ranking member, Mr. Elliot Engel of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling this hearing, and, and, and thank you for leading uh, CODEL uh, to, uh, to Africa. Um, this committee realizes how important Africa is, and uh, I'm glad that we're having this hearing uh, this morning. Um, countering uh, terrorist groups in Africa is a clear foreign policy priority, and it deserves this committee's attention. Mr. Deputy Secretary, Mr. Acting Undersecretary, welcome to the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, around the world, uh, hot spots are burning and American leadership is needed. But in the State Department, uh, with, with all the vacancies and all the uh, cutbacks, um, it seems that strategies are muddled or seem muddled. Senior posts are vacant. Partners and adversaries view the United States with uncertainty. So I hope you can both shed some light today on this phenomenally complex issue. Uh, I have a number of concerns about how we're dealing with terrorism in Africa. And the first is our military involvement there. As the chairman pointed out, the recent deaths of four American service members in an ambush in Niger thrusts this issue into the spotlight. There's also been an increase in the number of American airstrikes in Somalia. For those strikes, the administration uses the same legal authority to justify military action as it and other administrations have for many other counter-terrorist operations all over the world, which is the post 9-11-2001 AUMF, authorization for the use of military force. I don't think any of us who voted on that measure, and I did 16 years ago, envisioned that it would be used as a blank check to justify sending our men and women in uniform into harm's way whenever a terrorist threat emerges. We need a new AUMF. We need to have a serious debate about how, when, and where our military is currently fighting, and I need more answers about those four fallen heroes. I cannot help but wonder what happened to that thirst for oversight we saw a couple of years ago when several Americans died on the African continent in circumstances shrouded by uncertainty. Yet our military's role in dealing with these extremist groups should be only one aspect of our approach to fighting terrorism. I agree with many the many national security experts who say our strategy must go far beyond fighting fire with fire. We must also look at the root causes that allow terrorism to take hold in these countries. The places in Africa where terrorists operate often face an uh, underlying level of instability. Governments are unresponsive and ineffective in providing for the needs of their citizens. Some of our closest partners in this effort, Cameroon, Chad, and Uganda, are led by men who have clung to power for decades. In one recent study, more than 70 percent of Africans surveyed reported mistrust of the police and military. And that's no great surprise, given the behavior of some of our counterterrorism partners. Arbitrary arrests, forced disappearances, and torture in Cameroon. A thousand protesters killed and another 11,000 detained in Ethiopia. And in Uganda, Kenya, and Burundi, civilians speaking up for their rights and demanding accountable leadership are met with violent crackdowns, bloodshed, and killing. These are the things that drive people toward violent extremism and that attracts terrorists seeking to exploit vulnerable populations. When human rights, the rule of law, and justice systems are weak, al-Shabaab, al-Qaeda, and others find safe haven. And that's what we need to focus on. A military-heavy strategy means that we're pushing back against these groups after they're already established. Of course, that's important, and we should continue doing that. But we must also work to deny these groups the opportunity to flourish in the first place. The State Department and USAID have the expertise to do that. Our diplomats and development professionals work to promote justice and the rule of law, to build more inclusive societies through better education, health care and economic opportunity, encouraging full participation in societies rather than withdrawing into extremism. These are indispensable tools in the fight against terrorism. That's why I'm baffled that the administration wants to cut the budget for these agencies by a third. 
Frankly, I'm frustrated that the State Department appears to be descending into dysfunction, not the fault of anybody here, but if you cut back and don't fill senior positions, what else do you have? As we're reading day after day after day about the dysfunction, foreign policy leaders from former Secretaries Madeleine Albright to Ambassadors Nicholas Burns and Ryan Crocker are all sounding the alarm. So I'd like to hear how slashing the State Department and USAID helps us stop violent extremism. How does gutting vital e efforts to help us get at the root causes of this problem? Why would, would we cut resources for democracy promotion, for human rights, for foreign assistance, when we know that these cost-effective investments will help us grapple with the problem of terrorism? What I don't want to hear and I won't accept is that we can't afford it. The President's ready to sign legislation that will blow a trillion and a half dollar hole in the budget to give tax breaks to corporations and billionaires. So we can't afford it line doesn't pass the test anymore. If we're serious about fighting terrorism, let the military tackle the security threats, but let's make a serious effort to stop it before it starts. Uh, gentlemen, I look forward to your testimony. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Engel. Uh, this morning we're pleased to be joined by a very distinguished panel. Mr. John Sullivan is the Deputy Secretary of State, and prior to this position, he was a partner at the Mayor Brown Law Firm where he co-chaired its national security pro uh, practice. Prior to that, uh, Mr. Sullivan served in senior positions at uh, the Justice Department, Defense Department, and Commerce Department. The Honorable David uh, Trachtenberg uh, was confirmed by the U.S. Senate on October 17th. Uh, Dr. Trachtenberg is Principal Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, and he is currently serving as the Acting Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in that position. Prior to this work in the executive branch and private sector, he served on the staff of the House Armed Services Committee. So it's good to see him again. And without objection, the witnesses' full prepared statements are going to be made part of the record. Members here are going to have five calendar days to submit any statements or questions to you or any extraneous material for the record. And uh, if you would, Mr. Sullivan, uh, please summarize your remarks. We'll, we'll start with you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Rangel, members of the committee, for the opportunity to speak with you about U.S. counterterrorism efforts in Africa. Last month, Secretary Tillerson hosted an Africa ministerial that included delegations from 37 countries, the African Union, and members of the private sector and civil society. Advancing our deep and expanding counterterrorism cooperation on the continent was a major focus of the ministerial, along with increasing trade, good governance, and protection of human rights. To reinforce these priorities, at Secretary Tillerson's direction, I traveled to Sudan, Tunisia, and Nigeria two weeks ago to engage our willing and increasingly capable counterterrorism partners. In Sudan, senior leaders stressed their interest in working with the United States to strengthen regional security and promote greater peace and stability throughout the region and the world. We were encouraged by the Sudanese government's willingness to work with us to eliminate the threat posed by ISIS and other terrorist groups operating in the region, as well as the government's commitment to cut all military and trade ties with North Korea. In Tunisia, I met with both the Tunisian and Libyan governments. Tunisia, like Morocco and Algeria, has made significant strides in preventing the spread of ISIS and other terrorist groups within its borders through the implementation of military and paramilitary operations greater law enforcement cooperation among allies and partners, and improve measures to reintegrate returning foreign terrorist fighters. Libya is perhaps our greatest counterterrorism challenge in Africa. ISIS and other, and other terrorist groups have sought to exploit political instability and find safe haven in Libya's vast, ungoverned spaces, making the country both a source of and destination for foreign terrorist fighters. We continue to empower the Libyan government to address these challenges. Libyan Prime Minister Fayez al sarraz's government and its aligned forces have been reliable partners in countering these threats and are in regular communication with the administration and with our ambassador, Peter Bodhi. 
President Trump and Secretaries Tillerson and Madison, Mattis met with the Prime Minister just last week to discuss a range of issues, including counterterrorism. We also strongly back the efforts of UN Special Re Representative Salame to facilitate a political solution and prevent a civil conflict. Nigeria was the last stop on my trip, and it's a, crucial, a critical U.S. partner that faces a number of threats. Nigeria leads the regional fight against Boko Haram, ISIS West Africa, and other terrorist groups that continue to fuel one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world. Since 2009, terrorist groups in the region have killed more than 20,000 people and abducted thousands of women, women and girls, causing at least 2 million people to flee their homes. This instability has affected the larger Lake Chad Basin region, prompting the creation of a multinational joint task force comprised of Benin, Cameroon, Chad, and Niger, all partners that have asked for U.S. assistance to root out terrorism. We consider it in our national interest to support Nigeria and its neighbors in this fight. To ensure our continued cooperation, we've also underlined to these partners and those across the continent that their security forces must be professionalized, brought into a, an accountable chain of command, and held responsible for human rights abuses. These principles are also the backbone of our engagement of, in Somalia, where we're committed to helping Somalia reform its security sector and improve governance with a focus on reducing corrupt practices and increasing transparency and, and accountability. In coordination with that effort, U.S. forces are committed to using all authorized and appropriate measures to protect Americans and to disable terrorist threats such as al-Shabaab and ISIS. Somalia is also a prime example of how we're working with the African Union, the United Nations, and other multilateral organizations to counter terrorism, promote stability, and support post-conflict peace building. Regional cooperation has clearly produced results as we have seen in the creation of the G5 by Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Mauritania, and Niger in 2014. Last month, Secretary Tillerson announced our commitment to provide an additional $60 million in, in support to the G5 Sahel Joint Force countries. This is in addition to the more than $800 million in bilateral assistance we've provided to G5 countries since 2012 to help develop effective security forces. In closing, I want to underscore a message that I made clear during all my stops on my trip. While the United States is the largest supporter of peacekeeping and counterterrorism across Africa, the Secretary and I firmly believe that traditional counterterrorism counter efforts alone are not enough. Economic reform, good governance, and respect for human rights must be prioritized to establish and maintain peace and security throughout the continent. We will continue to support our partners' efforts to strengthen democratic institutions, improve citizen security and justice, respect human rights, stimulate economic growth, trade, health, and investment, and promote development and education. The United States continues to emphasize respect for human rights as a fundamental part of our counterterrorism strategy, which includes thorough Leahy vetting of our security force partners. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this morning, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, David? Good morning, Chairman Royce, Ranking Member Engel, and members of the committee. Let me begin by thanking you for the opportunity to appear here with Deputy Secretary of State Sullivan. This is my first testimony since assuming my position just a few weeks ago as the Principal Deputy and the Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. But as a former House Committee staffer, I'm keenly aware of the important oversight role Congress plays on national security issues, and I appreciate being here today. Before I go any further, I want to express, on behalf of the entire Department of Defense, our deepest sympathies to the families of the soldiers killed in the Niger ambush. Staff Sergeant Brian Black, Sergeant LaDavid Johnson, Staff Sergeant Dustin Wright, and Staff Sergeant Jeremiah Johnson. We also hope for the continued speedy recovery of both Captain Michael Perizzini and Sergeant First Class Brent Bartles. 
We honor the service and sacrifice of these Americans, and we owe it to them, their families, and their fellow soldiers to investigate the events of October 4th thoroughly. The death of any service member is something that has a profound effect on all of us at DOD, and the investigation is proceeding with due diligence and care. As we have briefed to you and other committees, the investigation is ongoing, and we do not want to provide inaccurate or incomplete information. We must, therefore, wait for the investigation to be completed by AFRICOM before we can have the full picture of what happened. However, we will inform Congress on the conclusions of the investigation as soon as possible after the families are briefed. That said, we must remember that our efforts in Africa are vitally important. Today, our African partners are confronting a complex and growing threat from multiple terrorist groups, including ISIS and Al-Qaeda affiliates, and other extremist groups like Boko Haram. These groups exploit instability, weak governance, vulnerable populations, social media, and vast spaces to establish safe havens, spread their toxic ideology, and attack all who do not subscribe to it. While DOD maintains expert counterterrorism forces, the best in the world, bar none, capable of conducting precision airstrikes and complex raids to protect our interests, we are focused principally on helping our partners build their own capabilities and expand their capacity to fight these terrorist organizations and stem further violence and instability. Secretary Mattis has placed a significant emphasis on building and strengthening partnerships to both lessen the demand for U.S. forces and to ensure sustainable indigenous solutions to these problems. In the simplest terms, DOD seeks to work by, with, and through our partners in Africa to find African solutions to African problems. This means that military operations against terrorist organizations are conducted by host nation forces. U.S. forces work with our partners to train, equip, advise, enable, and accompany them on operations and improve their effectiveness and professionalism. And through this cooperative relationship, the United States and our partners in Africa achieve our shared strategic objectives. As we work to build partner capacity, I want to note that we are not simply looking at military effectiveness, but we also place a high value on professionalization of our partners' militaries, and specifically to improving their adherence to norms for respecting human rights. In addition to bilateral partnerships, we also seek to work closely with regional organizations like the African Union and the G5 Sahel Joint Task Force. We also partner with other nations like France, who have committed thousands of troops to share the burdens on this vast continent. And of course, our most important partners are the other departments and agencies of the United States government. There is no purely military solution to the terrorism threat in Africa, and DOD is committed to promoting whole of government solutions. This requires that we leverage the full range of resources, talent, and expertise to address these problems. This is particularly true of our colleagues in the Department of State and USAID, and we are committed to working together with them to protect the United States, our citizens, and our interests in Africa. Thank you for the opportunity to testify to this committee on a topic of such critical importance. The Department of Defense appreciates your leadership and oversight in this area, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, David. Uh, let me just say to Deputy Secretary Sullivan uh, th that we're very eager to hear about your trip to Tunisia, to Sudan, to uh, Nigeria. All three of these countries are important in terms of our counterterrorism efforts. Um, and while, you're, while you were over there, I know that uh, Secretary Tillerson had uh, several dozen African foreign ministers here. 
uh, for meetings in Washington. We also had the opportunity in the committee to sit down with Nikki Haley, Ambassador Haley, after her visit to Africa. Um, and, and we ourselves on the committee have been engaged. We've, we've been to these countries in order to discuss these issues as well. So we're very glad you made the trip. I think this high-level engage, engagement is important, but one point I would make is it can't substitute for the day-to-day -day efforts of our ambassadors on the ground there. Uh, and as you know, ambassadors have expressed, and members here have expressed concerns about the redesign. So we, we want to maintain a robust presence overseas, including Africa, and having diplomats on the ground strengthens our counterterrorism uh, efforts there. Uh, can you and uh, the Undersecretary uh, Trachenberg walk us through the Departments of State and Departments of Defense and how you work together to build capabilities for our African partners? If you would uh, explain some of that, and then maybe uh, the other thing that I'd like you to focus on is the greatest challenges that you face when working with African militaries and African governments. I'll give you the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, the, uh, the Department of State and uh, the Department of Defense, and in particular, AFRICOM, General Waldhauser, and our ambassadors in, uh, in the 51 countries in the continent uh, of Africa, have developed a very close working relationship. I can give you a particular example that I spent a lot of time focused on during my trip, and that is the cooperation between our ambassador to Libya, Peter Bode, and General Waldhauser on uh, not just counterterrorism, but political and economic development and stabilization in Libya. Uh, if I could for a moment, uh, just to address the, the concern you raised about uh, Having, uh, having ambassadors in the field. Um, I'll be the first to concede, as I've done before this committee, that we have not done enough to, uh, to get uh, appointees in place in positions at the department and ambassadors into posts. But in Africa, we actually have uh, a 90% uh, of our, uh, our posts have uh, ambassadors in, in residence in, at post or they've been confirmed and are en route. So 44 out of the 51 countries uh, in Africa have an ambassador. Uh, so that is uh, in what I can't describe as a, uh, uh, a good news story for the department across all regions. For Africa, uh, we do have 90% uh, of our ambassadors at, at post. I'll defer to uh, Undersecretary Trachtenberg for further comment. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, let me, let me echo uh, what uh, Secretary uh, Sullivan has, has said. In terms of the relationship between the Department of Defense and the Department of State on this particular issue, the cooperation and coordination is extremely good. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is that in many respects, the Department of Defense plays a supporting role to the Department of State and, and other agencies because the problems of terrorism that we are talking about on the African continent deal with, at their very heart, some of the issues that you mentioned in, in your opening statement, the, the issue of uh, uh, weak governance in some of these countries, uh, poverty, exploiting local grievances. Our work at, uh, within DOD in working with our partner nations is to help provide those partner countries with the capacity themselves to be able to uh, to be able to defend themselves against extremist organizations and terrorist capacities but that is of course not the end of the story and so that is why we work very closely with our State Department colleagues to make sure that once security is provided effective tools can be put in place to improve governance and deal with some of the underlying issues that give rise to some of these uh, violent extremist uh, organizations uh, in the first place. My time's expired. I'll go to Mr. Elliot Ingle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, um, I, I, I appreciate 
all your hard work and your efforts at outreach. I, I, I sincerely do, and, and I think that you're doing an outstanding job, um, and I appreciate your contact with, with the committee and your accessibility. Um, but as you know, when we, if we, as we've discussed, and as I just mentioned before, the, um, it, you, you cannot pick up a newspaper these days without seeing a, he a headline about how Secretary Tillerson is hallowing out the State Department, and particularly the far Foreign um, Service. Um, Mr. Secretary, when you testified before the committee in late September, uh, you acknowledged that morale of the department was, was low. Let me ask you the same question. How is morale today, and, 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 and what will you do to improve morale and better utilize our country's diplomats? Uh, thank you, Congressman Engel. Uh, morale hasn't improved. Uh, it's uh, not, a, uh, not something that I'm, I'm proud to say, but it's a problem that the Secretary and I have spoken about. He's now on a trip to Europe. Uh, he's getting back uh, later this week. We'll be coming up here to brief members of this committee uh, and other members of Congress and senators on uh, an update on a re the redesign, which I've testified about previously, uh, and also have a town hall with, uh, with the uh, employees, the women and men of the, the State Department, to describe the work that has been done uh, on the redesign in the two months since I've, I last testified before this committee, but to renew his commitment to the department, to acknowledge the, the uh, I think one of our greatest failings has been a lack of communication, communication particularly with uh, our own career professionals, both at state and in the field, uh, and a rededication to, uh, to do a better job of that. And I, of course, with this committee, uh, commit that to you as well, that uh, I'm committed both to communicating with our, our men and women about our, our plans and uh, their value to us, and also to, uh, to you and the members of the committee. Um, as I thank you, as I've, as I've mentioned before, and I want to I say it again on the record, that I am very troubled uh, by the redesign. Um, I, I am worried that the redesign will be used as an excuse to cut back uh, and I don't think that we should be cutting back at a, at a time like this when hopefully we use diplomacy to prevent wars. And uh, no matter where you go, no matter where you travel around the globe, Africa and, and, and any place else, uh, people will pull you aside and tell you how demoralized they are, how they really feel that the administration is, is sort of going after the State Department. Um, and it really bothers me a great deal. Those of us that have been on this committee for decades um, appreciate the good work that our diplomats do and that uh, people do all around the world, as, I, as I'm sure you do. But you, you can just, you know, you can't take, um, uh, you can't cut back, in my opinion, at the rate that the administration has announced it would like to and, and have an effective workforce. It just can't be done. So I want, I raise this because I want to raise it every time because I'm hoping that, that there'll be uh, policies that will be rethought and uh, the, the cutbacks as you know we uh, described on this committee and it was on both sides of the aisle there was chagrin uh, about the cutbacks uh, um, so I, I just wanted to, to raise that with you so um, I'm concerned about the uh, imbalance between military and uh, non-military approaches to countering terrorism in sub-Saharan Africa. For one, um, expanding use of airstrikes in Somalia uh, obviously increases the possibility of civilian casualties, which runs the risk of creating more terrorists than we're able to eliminate in the first place. I, I said that in my opening remarks. In, in addition, while security assistance funding to sub-Saharan Africa partner nations has doubled in the past five years. You know, again, 31 percent cut that's been proposed, uh, cutting the budgets of the State Department and USAID are the agency's best position to help prevent the emergence of terrorism in the first place. So it's almost like, you know, counterterrorism. And, and, you know, we worry that the, the redesign can be used as an excuse to just simply cut back. And that's what we are concerned about on, on both sides of the aisle. I don't want to put words into anybody's mouth, but I've been here and, and, and know what our joint concerns are. So 
please tell me about slashing funding. I know you didn't personally make this decision, but slashing, slashing funding for the State Department and USAID obviously doesn't help us address the drivers of terrorism and violent extremists in the long term. So I'd like to, to hear how we can fit one into the other and, and what measures um, are we taking to improve civilian protection and reduce the risk of civilian casualties while conducting airstrikes and other military operations? Well, uh, Congressman Engel, I would agree with you that the, the root causes of counterterrorism, uh, the situation we find ourselves in today, particularly on the African continent, the problems we see are not going to be solved by military action uh, alone. Uh, in fact, uh, I think Secretary Mattis has, has testified and made clear, as has Secretary Tillerson, that a focus on good governance, human rights, training for partner militaries are extremely important. Your question about how we're going to do that with our funding, we will do all we can with the funds that we have available. We advocate for uh, the resources that we believe are necessary within the administration to meet our mission. We'll do all we can to meet that mission, to develop those policies, support our partners and allies with the understanding that good governance, economic development, humanitarian assistance, ultimately, and I'll give you an example, Libya, we believe that solving the serious challenges we face in Libya is ultimately a political question. It's not going to be solved by military action or by counterterrorism alone. All right, thank you. My time is up, but I, I will submit some other questions uh, to you. Thank you. Chris Smith of New Jersey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony and leadership, gentlemen. Uh, time is obviously very short, so I'm going to focus on Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Nigeria. Uh, ever since the Mellis government, Ethiopia has asserted its role in combating terrorism as a cover for the ongoing systematic abuse of human rights. After a seriously flawed election in 2005, I met with President Mellis at Addis Ababa, and as predicted, he just rolled out the terrorism card uh, as cover. Uh, as uh, to mitigate criticism, mine and many others, particularly human rights organizations, for the killings in the streets, the use of torture, the jailings. In response, I introduced the Ethiopia Human Rights Act. Uh, it was killed by lobbyists, frankly, and, uh, and was not looked at favorably by the State Department, even though the findings were uh, John Don Payne, my ranking member, and I introduced it, and we, and then when the Democrats took control. He took the lead on the bill, and I was his co-sponsor. Uh, but it was always like pushback. It's, uh, well, they're good on terrorism, but awful on human rights. So your thoughts on how, where, how often do we raise human rights with Ethiopia? Uh, we have a resolution pending now, which probably may come up in the House floor. I don't know. Uh, but it seems to me, uh, you know, they can't say, oh, we're doing well over here while they abuse their own people and torture them. Secondly, uh, twice in the last 15 months I've been to South Sudan, joined most recently by my good friend and colleague, Karen Bass, and we raised with Mellis, not Mellis, with uh, Salva Kiir, uh, his horrific record and his killings. And I'm wondering, you know, are we really pressing? I know uh, our, 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 the leadership, especially our ambassador to the U UN, uh, has really raised it very robustly. Kiir is a grave disappointment to everyone what's being done there, because I think that the, the potential and the reality of, of violence is very real. Finally, on Nigeria, um, I held a whole series of hearings, been, went there many times, kept saying, why aren't we training uh, more of those who could be Leahy vetted? As a matter of fact, in one of my hearings, the department said at least half of the Nigerian military would gain muster under the Leahy process, but very few were trained. If you could give an update how well or poorly we're doing in terms of training the Nigerian military. You know, it took years to get an FTO designation uh, for Boko Haram. Uh, I held hearings on it introduced a resolution. The day we were marking it up, the department reverses itself and says, oh, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and do an FTO designation. Day, days late, years late, and a dollar short. Uh, but how well is that working as well? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Congressman Smith. First, on Ethiopia, I met with the Ethiopian foreign minister in June. Uh, in his trip here. It was one of my first meetings as Deputy Secretary of State. I raised with him human rights concerns in Ethiopia, specific cases of detainees, the state of emergency that's been declared, the need for it to be lifted, specifically raised it with him. I will always raise those issues with you, sir. I guarantee it. I, when I was in Sudan... I deeply appreciate that. Uh, when, thank you. When I was in Sudan, 
We're getting great cooperation from the Sudanese on counterterrorism. I raised human rights issues, religious liberty issues with Sudan, gave a speech on religious liberty at the largest mosque in Khartoum. It was not well received. Uh, it had a very uh, unflattering press statement by an imam affiliated with ISIS that made some threats about me. Uh, I will always raise those issues. We, the department, and I are, are committed to it. On South Suzanne, as you know, Ambassador Haley uh, was there before I. We sort of split responsibility. I went to Khartoum. She went to Juba. She's raised those issues in Juba. I raise concerns about Sudan's influence in South Sudan with the government in Khartoum. Very important issue for us. Nigeria, I, uh, I don't know if Undersecretary Trachtenberg has more, uh, more statistics to give. Uh, we're focused on Leahy vetting for uh, as many of the forces as we can uh, at the brigade level on down. Uh, the, the threat posed by not just Boko Haram, but ISIS West Africa in northeastern Nigeria is acute. And we need to support those forces that can be trusted, that are trained by us, to meet that threat. I know that time is limited, so I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thank Mark. you, Ms. Sullivan. Uh, th uh, thank you, Congressman Smith. The, the only thing I would add to that is, is to say that the Department of Defense is no less committed than the, the Department of State is to ensuring that human rights practices are, are, are followed. Uh, we very strictly adhere to the Leahy Law. Uh, we hold our partner forces, the partner forces that we engage with, to our same standards and expectations. We include human rights training in our security assistance programs, and we would cease providing. And that includes, if I don't mind the interrupting, that would also include human trafficking, where military so often are complicit. Uh, it, it, it includes uh, various elements of human rights, uh, including in, trafficking in, in, involving human rights, sir. Including trafficking. I, I, I believe that's correct. I if you could get back to us on, absolutely. on, on that. Absolutely. Oh, 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 absolutely. But uh, in the event there are human rights abuses, uh, we will then we will stop under the Leahy law. That, that, that training activity. Right, but, but in just in terms of that dialogue, my hope is that we are robustly raising the trafficking issue as well, including- Oh, absolutely, and, I, and I'll be delighted to get back to you with I additional information. That. Thank you so much. Greg Meeks of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, welcome back. Let me ask a quick question. I was just concerned or confused, and then maybe you can have the answer. On November 28th, there was an event uh, at the Wilson Center where Secretary Tillerson said that the President Trump's draconian cuts to the international affairs budget were, quote, reflective of an expectation that we're going to have <clears throat> success in some of these conflicted areas. Uh, this, to me, I don't know, seemed extraordinarily naive, but can you tell me uh, what specific conflicts do you think will be resolved in the coming year? Uh, I, I don't have a crystal ball to give you a precise answer, Congressman. I take the thrust of your, your question about our prospects for being able to achieve success in Syria, Yemen, all of those places. I don't think that that's something that's going to happen uh, uh, anytime soon. We need to be focused on doing all we can to, uh, to support our partners, our allies, and our military uh, in, their, in uh, the military fight, but all the things that we can support on that we've discussed, the non-military aspect. And I couldn't agree with you more, because that's why, and you know, going on what Ranking Member Engel had talked about, because if we're gonna resolve some of these, it's not gonna just be militarily, we need to, diplom to do it diplomatically also. And, uh, and that's why I think on a bipartisan way, we are disturbed when we see the draconian cuts and the reduction of personnel because we can't do it without you at the State Department. I mean, if we're gonna do this thing, we need you uh, and we need the people there. And, and, I, and, and that's my point. And I know you are under constraints, but, but we need you. Well, and reduction. give you a very precise example, Congressman, in Syria, in Raqqa, uh, in Iraq, in Mosul, where the military in supporting our, uh, our partners and allies have done the job of defeating ISIS militarily. It's now up to the State Department to come in. We're not gonna take over governance of those areas, but we've gotta provide basic stabilization support for water, safety, getting internally displaced persons back, uh, a key element for us. We could very easily lose the fight uh, on those grounds uh, that the military has done such a great job in winning on the battlefield for us. And I always salute the men and women of the State Department and the job that you're doing. It is, and I hate to hear your honesty when you come back and talk about uh, 
the, the lack of morale there, but they are serving our country in a very big way, in the most important way. And if we're going to get to some of these conflicts, it's going to only be with the help of the men and women of the State Department. So I still take, I take my hat off to them. Let me, let me just ask another question because I want to know whether or not there's a connection or not. You know, I'm deeply disturbed when I hear about slave trafficking in, uh, in, in, in Libya. And um, I'm wondering whether there's a tie-in uh, some way where there's a link uh, to the exportation tied to terrorists and terrorism with some of the slave trading that's uh, taking place in, 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 in Libya today. Is there any tie-in that you see there? Uh, I, I believe there is. The, the reports of uh, what's happening in those, uh, in those camps where uh, migrants, refugees, are, uh, are being abused, exploited, uh, and slave trade. Uh, shocking. It's happening in, in areas of Lib Libya that are largely ungoverned, uh, which is why we need, we're working hard along with the UN for a political solution to the situation to, to get more control over those areas. But in those ungoverned areas where uh, ISIS and other terrorist organizations are able to operate, they make money by engaging in activities mm -hmm. like that. And, 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 and you touched on this earlier, too, because there was a uh, recent survey that was conducted by the United Nations Development Program that found that 71 percent of respondents pointed to an adverse interaction with state security forces as the factor of the tipping point in the decision to join a terrorist organization. So, and I know uh, Mr. Smith talked about the Leahy vetting and we talked about human rights training. Are there other ways that the administration can or is seeking to ensure that the partner militaries uh, uh, that are accused of human rights violations pursue tangible measures of accountability uh, for such actions? Two tracks, and you've, you've highlighted both. One is through DOD and with the State Department's support, vetting those organizations, military organizations, that we're going to work with and provide funding and support to. But second, working with the, with, uh, with the governments to provide that there is accountability, there's pros investigations, prosecutions, and accountability is a key component. Uh, it's similar with our approach on human trafficking, trafficking in persons. One of the pillar, there are several pillars. One is breaking up the networks, but the second is working with governments to make sure that those who are engaged are investigated, prosecuted, held accountable, and punished. Thank you. My time has expired. We go to Mr. Dana Rohrbacher of California. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your testimony today. And I know Chairman Royce has had a very keen interest in Africa since the day he arrived in the United States Congress, as long as broadcasting. So uh, we, we are actually paying more attention to Africa today because of his leadership. Um, I would admit my limited knowledge of Africa. And, uh, but let me just note uh, after my re sort of response to what you're saying is that I'm wondering how all of this fits in with an overall strategy of how you deal with the world. I would hope that the United States, and I don't think we'll ever be able to afford uh, what appears to be the development of an idea that we have a Pax Americana, that we can go all over the world and wherever there is problems, we are going to come in and try to solve those problems. We're going to go broke if we try to do that. I mean, I just there was a Pax Britannia, and that was able to last a short period of time, and a Pax Americana will last a short period of time if we get that. I, uh, we, for example, and we, by being the grand decision makers, end up making Yes, some good decisions and trying to help good or good-hearted people trying to do the best. But for example, uh, Mr. Sullivan, do you believe that the uh, now that you just came back from Libya, do you believe that it was right for us to break that uh, compromise that had been reached uh, with Gaddafi, for example? Would it have been? Are we worse off today or better off today because America came in? and decided we we're going to get rid of Gaddafi and sided with the rebels who uh, which they wouldn't have succeeded without our help. Or is, is Libya better today or America, is, is the world better because we uh, got rid of Gaddafi? Uh, well, 
the uh, w in my re remark comments to uh, Congressman Weeks, I spoke about the uh, the ungoverned areas in Libya. Libya is certainly today uh, a place that is a significant as a significant uh, focus of our counterterrorism. For that very reason, what we don't want is a place where, as there was in Sudan in the 1990s or Afghanistan in, uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, places where terrorist organizations can plant root, flourish, plan attacks against the United States. That's what we want to eliminate, in addition to supporting governments in the region. And, and, and when we had Gaddafi there, you know, I think the, the greatest mistakes, there are two great mistakes made by the United States in my lifetime. One was to send combat troops into Vietnam, and the other is to send combat troops to get rid of Saddam Hussein. And the Saddam Hussein was just benevolence. We had to bestow democracy on those people, and it's unleashed all of this chaos. Uh, I don't believe that we can have a Pax Americana. We have to be really a little bit more thoughtful. For example, uh, 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 Congressman Smith just talked about Ethiopia where I have, I have constituents who were ripped off by the Ethiopian government and the corruption there and the oppression now, uh, even though we have been friendly to the Ethiopian government. There's, but there's a player in all of that that I see and I'd like to ask you about, and that is money. These people who run these dictatorships, and also these groups that are terrorist groups, but mainly the, 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 the authoritarian leaders in, in Africa, do they not have bank accounts someplace in the world? And can we prevent them? Our bankers, we got global bankers who are basically partners in the ripoff of, of the world's poorest people. And we just never seem to focus on that part of the, of the criminal element the bankers. Could you? Uh, that's, a, that's an extremely important point and relevant to my trip to Nigeria, where the Nigerian government is focused on recovering billions that's been looted from that country. We worked with the Justice Department when I was there two weeks ago with our Justice Department, uh, our embassy in the Nigerian government, trying to trying to get back to the Nigerian government that money that was in the United States that we could get control of. It's a small fraction. Well, I don't think I'm just talking about the United States banks. We have an but, international banking system, and quite frankly, the, 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 the gang that runs Ethiopia or, uh, right. have bank accounts somewhere to the tune of billions, probably hundreds of millions of dollars, but that's true throughout Africa. Absolutely. I think that if we're going to help, rather than just trying to be holier than thou about human rights violations, and this is our standard. Let's, if we're gonna to try to help them develop, we've gotta prevent them from being ripped off and having the wealth sucked out by their corrupt leaders in partnership with banks. You're, you're absolutely right, and it's, it's banks outside the United States right. that are principally That's the right. focus. Right. We try to establish trust with the government by saying that money which we can immediately access here in the United States, we're gonna get back to you but also work with them and other countries for those other banks elsewhere where we don't have as much, we don't have jurisdiction, frankly, but working to get that money back. It's a huge problem and a priority for those governments that are focused on good government as we'll, opposed to self-interest. We'll self be happy to work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We go to Mr. Albio Ceres of New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sullivan, I want to first thank you for your service to this country. You serve in many capacities and now you got a real difficult job, and I thank you for your service. But I do not agree with you that in the State Department morale is improving. I still see qualified people leaving. I still see the President still insisting on a 30 percent cut. Uh, the Secretary seems to be a little distant from, uh, from everything. So I, I don't know if I really agree with you that things are really improving there. Uh, you know, until we stop losing all these good people that have worked there so long and, and have given so much to the State Department, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a job for you. So uh, go ahead. If you want. I thought that's what you said. It hasn't improved. It must be my English then. I'm still learning it. 
But uh, Mr. Sec uh, Mr. Stelos, uh, Mr. Sullivan, one of the things that I always pride myself on is freedom of speech. You know, I, I've been an advocate here for a long time uh, since I've been here. And I'm disheartened by the president's unrelenting effort to slash State Department's efforts to defend freedom of speech around the world. What is the rationale behind the administration putting money towards free press programs in places like Hungary, but yet when it comes to Cuba, we cut it. When it comes to Venezuela, we cut it. How, who determines where this money goes? How, 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 is, that, how is that, you know, for, for, for uh, promoting free press and, uh, in these countries? Well, it's certainly the, the case that uh, Secretary Tillerson and I, the department, are strong advocates for freedom of the press. Uh, I raised this issue on my travels in Africa two weeks ago. With respect to specific allocations, I'd have to get back to you on Cuba and Venezuela. It may have to do with partners that we were supporting there. I'm, rel I'm aware of the, the program in, in Hungary to which you, which you reference, uh, but I'd happy, be happy to get back to you on uh, more specific uh, information with respect to Cuba and Venezuela. That would be great. And how concerned are you that the Libyan situation is going to spill over into Tunisia and Morocco? Uh, very concerned, as are the Tunisians uh, in particular. Uh, we've spent a lot of time focused on uh, border security for Tunisia. We've worked in partnership with, uh, with DOD and AFRICOM on border security, in, in not just the land border, but the maritime uh, border as well. Uh, very important. The Tunisians are concerned about it. We're devoting a lot of resources to it. In Morocco? Morocco as well, same situation. Libya is, as I said in my opening remarks, both a magnet for foreign terrorist fighters and a source. Uh, so we're doing all we can, and I defer to Undersecretary Trachtenberg if he has other, other thoughts to offer, but border security for those uh, North African countries uh, on either side of Libya is extremely important. No, I would agree with that, uh, Congressman. Uh, ab uh, absolutely. Do you, do you see the hand of Iran in all these efforts? I, I think Iran is definitely a challenge, uh, reg certainly regionally. And uh, yes, there are a number of uh, ma uh, malign activities that Iran is engaged in uh, that we are focused on, that uh, I know the State Department is also focused on. Uh, and uh, I, I do agree, we need sort of a whole of government approach for dealing with some of these issues, but, but definitely I would agree with you on that. And I just read an article on Politico regarding Hezbollah, their increasing efforts in the Western Hemisphere. And I don't know if you saw the article, but I, I, it'd be great if you can look at that because it really talks about how they have increased their presence in, South, in Central America, South America and in Venezuela. So I was just wondering if you can comment on that. Uh, yes, I can. In fact, uh, the administration has been working on specifically a Hezbollah strategy, uh, and there are various aspects to it. There's Hezbollah in Lebanon, which has become, in a sense, uh, a, a local governing entity in southern Lebanon, in addition to a terrorist organization and influenced, uh, influencing events in, in Syria. But they're also projecting their uh, malign influence uh, elsewhere, including, unfortunately, in this hemisphere. You're absolutely right, and this administration is aware of it and focused on it. And I'd like to apologize for not uh, hearing correctly what you said before at the beginning. Thank you. The uh, chair recognizes uh, myself for questions. Um, I chair the Homeland Security uh, Committee, and um, so I've been a student of uh, counterterrorism for quite some time. I was a federal prosecutor as well. I know uh, Osama bin Laden was in Khartoum, then Afghanistan. Um, I saw the rise of ISIS in the caliphate during the tenure of my chairmanship, and fortunately, uh, we've crushed the caliphate, and we've defeated ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Um, but now I'm seeing a new phenomenon. I went to Egypt and the Sinai, and we saw the explosion in the mosque, uh, the downing of the Russian airliner. Um, I was in Tunisia, met the Libyan team. Uh, it's in chaos. Uh, Boko Haram is taking over in parts of Africa, uh, AQIM, uh, and other terrorist organizations. Um, 
What I'm worried about is that uh, as we squeeze a balloon, they're going to pop up somewhere else. In Africa, it seems to be the safe haven. Uh, they seek chaos. They seek uh, ungoverned territories and safe havens. And so I see uh, if we're trying to look in the future, it's, it's actually happening now that Africa is going to be the spot. It's going to be the hot spot. Um, there is a Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership um, that includes 11 African countries. I know the state has worked a... Uh, very diligently on this, and um, uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I was just hopeful you could give me maybe an update on how that uh, partnership is working. Well, the phenomenon you described is quite accurate, uh, Congressman. Uh, the uh, and we are, and I, I defer to Under Secretary Trachtenberg on this, but we're very focused on where those terrorist fighters that are leaving the Caliphate, what's left of it, and there isn't much. Uh, in Syria and Iraq, where they're going. Certainly Africa, parts of Africa, Libya, northeastern Nigeria, elsewhere, uh, seems to be uh, a landing place. But we're also seeing that uh, in other areas in South Asia and uh, in, in the Pacific as well, in the Philippines. Right. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a priority for us to not win the fight against the caliphate in Syria and Iraq, but lose track of where all, those, where all of those foreign fighters are going. Unfortunately, Libya has been uh, an attractive place for them because of the ungoverned areas that I described uh, earlier and that, that you mentioned and, and, and know so well. But I, I defer to my, my colleague, uh, Under Secretary Trachtenberg. Uh, uh, Congressman, I think you put your finger on the crux of the problem here when you talked about uh, victories in certain areas, uh, but yet uh, leading to problems in, in, in others. Uh, I, I tend to look at this, uh, the problem of uh, countering terrorism and extremist organizations, uh, it's something, something like a balloon, if I could use that analogy. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you squeeze the balloon in a certain place, uh, you, you will narrow it and take the air out of that place, but it will also balloon in other areas, it will expand in other areas. Uh, I think to a certain degree, that's what, uh, that's what we're seeing uh, by the flow of uh, foreign terrorist fighters from one area to another. I think our job in working by, with, and through our partners, and in working with uh, our colleagues at the State Department and, and elsewhere, is to deflate the balloon uh, in, in, in order to solve the problem uh, of uh, uh, terrorists and extremist groups moving simply from one location to uh, some other ungoverned space where they feel they have freedom of, more freedom of action. Can you uh, comment on the role of NGOs? I, I was at the Munich uh, Security Conference and I met with Bill Gates, the Gates Foundation. They do some great work in Africa. Uh, Bono and the One Campaign. Um, is that helpful, Secretary? NGOs are not just helpful, but essential. Uh, we partner with them everywhere, uh, particularly for humanitarian assistance. Uh, PEPFAR uh, relies on partnering with, with NGOs. Really key, key for us. I think it would be key to stability. I think what we need is stability, stability. and it's very fragile and inst unstable. Uh, Good governance, health, uh, uh, economic development, humanitarian assistance, basic stability issues that we need in places like Raqqa or in Mosul for just water, sanitation, uh, demining, uh, medical services, all key things that uh, need to be restored in places that have just been decimated. I agree with uh, Secretary Sullivan on that, sir. Uh, it is true. Uh, again, again, what DOD is doing is basically attempting to work with our partners in the region to establish the security conditions that will allow these other priorities to be put into place uh, in order to deal with some of the underlying reasons uh, for the uh, uh, for the rise of terrorist and extremist uh, uh, activities there. So, uh, absolutely concur. Thank you. I agree, uh, and thank you for that. Uh testimony. Uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Ms. Bass. And let, oh, let me just say I appreciate your questions about NGOs. I, I'm hoping that somewhere down the line we can look at how we do uh, foreign assistance because I think in some instances some of the countries could do for themselves and maybe we need to focus on infrastructure like electricity and roads and things like that. So I, I look forward in the future to working with you on that. 
Um, a couple of quick questions. Mr. Sullivan, th there were a few times that you kept referring to 51 African countries. Why? Is that because we're involved in 51 as opposed to 54, but why? Uh, 54 posts where we have, uh, have ambassadors. Was... Oh, I see. There's three countries where we don't. Right. I see. W what is that? Eritrea? Uh, uh, yeah, Eritrea. Uh... Well, that's okay. Sudan, uh, Sudan. We have a charge because we can't deal with Bashir, the president. And there's a, there's a third. So well, there are three where we don't. But I'll, I'll get Okay. Those uh, but, and but... since you mentioned Sudan, since we yeah. are you know, in the process of changing our policies there, what's the trajectory? Do we see having more than a charge or? Uh, I don't see that. That's not a near term you don't development see that, changing? that I foresee. My hope is that it will. I'm not counting on that. My visit there was to discuss all the work that we have to do with Sudan going forward. We took one step, right. as, as we've discussed in October, there are a lot more things that need to happen before we have full normal relations with, uh, with Sudan. And maybe in another setting I could hear some more details about that. I think as, that would be helpful. As we discussed before my trip, I'm yep. delighted to come talk with you and give you give a little more detail. All right, uh, and I, so I'm wondering if you can, um, I wasn't here when my colleague asked questions about Libya, but uh, tomorrow uh, representatives of the Congressional Black Caucus are meeting with the ambassador from Libya, deeply concerned about the whole situation that CNN exposed regarding the slave trade. And uh, in general, I mean, once Gaddafi uh, was overthrown, the sub-Saharan Africans that were in Libya were mistreated from the beginning because they were viewed as pro gaddafi uh, forces and so I was just wondering if there's anything you might offer us in preparation for that meeting with the ambassador tomorrow. With What's your view on this, specifically around the slave trade that has been exposed? We, meeting with our ambassador, with with Ambassador Bodhi. No, 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 no. Meeting with the Libyan. The Lib Oh, I'm sorry. The, with Libyan, the Libyan ambassador, ambassador oh, tomorrow. Uh, so two aspects of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it two really. Uh, one is. The camps themselves in uh, in Libya, which are difficult for us to get to, because they're in, uh, as as I've discussed, in ungoverned areas for the for the most part, where neither the the GNA, the government in Tripoli, Prime Minister Siraj, or uh, the Haftar group in uh, in in eastern uh, Libya really have have access to. So that presents a real problem for us in trying to directly address the problem. The, the larger issue for us, though, is the countries that those migrants, those refugees came from, mm -hmm. and addressing the situation in those countries, why they left, why they left right. Nigeria right. in the first place. And, you know, um, um, another note, I want to ask you one more question before my time runs out, but maybe there is something that we can do with the EU, especially with this whole policy of sending people back and not knowing where they're going back to. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, Chad. Um, Chad's decision in October to withdraw troops from the multinational task force, uh, some analysts believe that that's one of the things that led to the instability along the border and the uh, attack on our special operation forces. And I, I wonder if Mr. Trackenberg can make a comment in that. Uh, uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, we, uh, from a DOD perspective, uh, we have not seen uh, any uh, uh, impact uh, uh, to uh, operational impact in terms of our ability to work uh, with the Chadian forces uh, as part of our uh, partnership, uh, counterterrorism partnership activities. Have so, we figured out why they were included in the Muslim ban, considering that they were our allies? Uh, I uh, uh, I do not have an answer. Do not. I mean, that's what led to them pulling out of the multinational task force. Uh, I, all all I can tell you, Congresswoman, is that uh, at least operationally, we we we've seen no uh, impact in terms of our ability to work with them as partners. <laughs> so you don't think that had anything to do with the attack on our special forces? Uh, I cannot. Uh, uh, that's a question I'd have to take for the record. I can't. Uh, I can't answer. One last question: Do you know how many troops we have on the continent? I mean, after that attack, that really raised a lot of questions because we thought it was a few hundred. How many U.S. troops are there on the continent of Africa? I think the issue of the troops that we have, the actual numbers and their and their locations, uh, is an issue that uh, I prefer not to address in a, in an open session. Okay, thank you. Yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, we now go to uh, Rep uh, Representative Ted Poe, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Terrorism, Nonproliferation, and Trade. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, congratulations on being uh, chair of this uh, committee in such a few months. Um, thank you, I, gentlemen, for being here. Wait, you, I'm not going to let you respond. Uh, <laughs> I do want to comment on something the general lady has, uh, made a comment earlier. Uh, just uh, for the record, the, uh, the committee's passed and the House has passed, and the, it's the law of the land that um, there will be an audit of foreign aid, and we will have that supposedly uh, audit uh, in January to see what all those NGOs are doing all over the country, all over the world, whether they're working or not working. I think it's long overdue. Uh, so uh, uh, I look forward, as you do, to, to that information. <clears throat> and I also want to follow up on, some, on the issue uh, of Libya specifically. Um, United States, in my opinion, recklessly intervened in Libya in 2011. We toppled the regime. Uh, we all thought we were doing such a great thing, but uh, Libya turned into a failed state, uh, another failure in American foreign policy to topple a regime and then uh, let it go into disarray. And because of that, uh, now we have uh, Libya with all of its different tribes and groups and governments uh, all in Libya trying to control the government of Libya. And a lot of these groups, in my opinion, are terrorist groups. Um, and uh, and now we know that Libya is a center point for people who want to get out of their situation in Africa, uh, being fooled to think that they can get to Libya and then go across the Mediterranean primarily to India, or not India, but Italy. Um, and people are being lied to that they will be smuggled and get a job and all of those things that we've heard about for years and they're lied to, primarily women and children, and all of a sudden they're in the slave trade. They are being kidnapped by modern day slave masters. Uh, they are turned into slaves. They're sold on the marketplace of slavery and human trafficking, some for a hundred dollars uh, and Bad things only happen to them. Now it's not just uh, uh, western uh, part of Africa where the smuggling route takes place. It's taking place from many different areas of Africa. Uh, folks just trying to have a better life and then they're, they're in the slave trade. Uh, I wouldn't say that the United States is at fault at this, but we destroyed the regime and its chaos in Libya. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Specifically, what terrorist groups are involved in the slave trade? I, I would have to get back to you for a specific answer. I can speculate. All right. I will have to get back to you with a, I want to give you a precise answer. If I could take that for the record, because I, I don't want to speculate. I don't know if under, the undersecretary may have more. Uh, relevant information. No, I would also, I would also uh, want to take that for the record. Okay, well, we will uh, hold you both uh, accountable for that because we want to know who those, uh, who those bad outlaws are and then develop a continuous policy of going after them. What is the United States foreign policy regarding Libya today? After all these years since 2011, uh, tell us what our policy is. What is our goals? What are we trying to do? What is, who do we support in Libya? Um, we deal with uh, Prime Minister Siraj, who is the head of the, uh, the GNA, his government in Tripoli. There is a Libyan political agreement in place that's been negotiated by, as you've mentioned, all the relevant tribes and entities. There's a process in place led by a, uh, a UN representative, representative of the Secretary General, the United States supports that political process to bring all those disparate elements together to, f to come up with a political solution so that we can have elections which are scheduled next year uh, and have a legitimate government in Libya that we can deal with. Okay. Mr. Ambassador, just reclaiming my time since I'm just almost out of time. Now that we know about the slave trade and that Libya is uh, a hub of the slave trade. What are we doing about that specific issue regarding Africans who are smuggled through Libya into Europe in the slave trade? 
Uh, two things. We've got a, a pre-existing program, trafficking in persons. Libya has become a key focus of that now. Trafficking in persons is a global problem. This is an acute problem we have to address in Libya. That's first. Second, we need to address the political and economic situations and support the governments in countries like Nigeria where those people are fleeing, leaving themselves open to be uh, abused in camps in Libya. I look forward to that list of terrorist groups. Thank you, gentlemen. Our legal bat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for that shout out as well. The chair recognizes David Cicilline from Rhode Island. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to our witnesses for being here. Mr. Sullivan, I want to begin with you. Uh, the president has declared his support for a tax bill that will add a trillion dollars to the national debt, yet he, Secretary Tillerson, you and others in the administration continue to use the deficit as an excuse for the deep cuts that have been proposed to the State Department and foreign assistance. And I'm just wondering whether, in light of this development, uh, whether your position has changed or whether you think it's still necessary or desirable uh, to support a 30% cut in USAID in the State Department? Well, as Secretary Tillerson has testified, uh, we believe we can uh, perform the mission of the State Department with the budget. So, so it's still the so position? Yes. So yes, yes. You, your position hasn't changed that. We're going to add a trillion dollars to the deficit for this tax bill, but that we still need to make these devastating cuts to the State Department and USAID because of the deficit. I just uh, want, okay, your answer is yes. My, I, I didn't take a position on the tax bill. I, I, no, no, I you're, you're taking a position that the deficit the is still the reason that we're making a 30% cut in the State Department and USAID that you support as, as I support that secretary. budget, yes, okay. I do. Okay. Uh, now, and you don't think there's any concern that our allies and partners around the world might not believe us next time we say we want to disengage from a program because we don't have resources? You don't think that, do you think it has any impact on the perception of the world about U.S. In leadership and global engagement? Uh, well, the, the department, the president, has made the case that we believe that it's important for countries that haven't stepped up for these programs okay. that they step up their commitment. So I, I take it the answer is no. We're here to talk about counterterror operations in Africa, and you mentioned that 90 percent of our ambassadors are in place in Africa, which is terrific. But I think you will agree that counterterrorism counter operations in Africa and the Middle East are inextricably linked. And my first question is, do you think we, you can achieve or we can achieve our goals for the region without an ambassador in Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Jordan, Qatar, Yemen, without an assistant secretary for ne Near Eastern Affairs? I'm sorry, can we achieve, can we achieve our, our, our objective goals? without these positions, these individuals being in place, doing the work that's required to be each of those ambassadors and each of those secretaries? Each of those positions is filled and we're doing the work. We could do it better if those positions were filled with Senate confirmed. Well, they're not filled with ambassadors. They're filled with acting individuals, correct? With chargés. So we have 50% of the positions in the State Department and USAID where an individual hasn't even been nominated for the position, correct? I'll take that number. Yes, I okay. believe that's roughly 50%, accurate. that includes the, all of the ambassadors I just mentioned and a number of additional positions, but 50%, you know, we keep hearing, oh, it's because the Senate's slowing down. The administration hasn't submitted half the people for these positions that are necessary. What, what's the delay? Well, the delay in part is... And how are we expected to do, advance the work of the United States and the national security interests and the diplomatic work? You can't engage in robust diplomacy without diplomats. You agree? Uh, I would agree with that. Okay. We have so I hope you'll do everything you can to encourage the president to actually appoint people to these very important positions that the rest of the world is wondering what we're doing and why we're not engaged. I hope you will take that message back. Uh, next, I'd like to ask you about uh, a very serious issue with respect to child soldiers. Uh, there's serious concern uh, in the Congress over reports that Secretary Tillerson acted in contravention of the child soldiers Prevention Act by not listing Afghanistan, Iraq, and Burma among those countries who use child soldiers. We know that the State Department's legal advisor, every relevant office and bureau, and even our embassies abroad believe that these three countries were required by statute to be listed, but they were not. As you know, the Child Soldiers Protection Act, Prevention Act requires the State Department to list any country, even if it's believed that countries were making progress that used child soldiers during the year without exception. Can you tell me why Secretary Tillerson chose to ignore the advice of so many State Department experts and the framework of the Child Soldiers Prevention Act and not list these three countries? 
Uh, based on the advice he got, he applied his judgment, applying the statute to the facts that were presented to him and made that decision. So the advice he got was to the contrary, it was to list the three countries. Do you know why he didn't? I, he, as I say, he applied his judgment, the applied the law to the facts. What, what does that mean? That means that he applied his judgment based on the recommendation he got, the, the materials that were presented to him, it was his judgment to make. Okay. Uh Next, Mr. Sullivan, uh, could you tell me, uh, I recently visited the Central African Republic and uh, saw the important work of the UN peacekeepers there and uh, would be interested to know what we can do uh, to better support the UN peacekeeping mission. I think in that particular place, we're at a very uh, sort of tipping point and uh, that mission uh, we want to ensure is successful. And w what can we be doing, what can the United States be doing to better support UN peacekeepers to be sure that they have both the training and the uh, equipment that they need to be successful? Well, uh, CAR in particular has been a, uh, an important topic for Ambassador Haley at the UN and working with the uh, Secretary General to improve both the, uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of peacekeeping operations generally, but in CAR in particular. It's a very important mission for us. And my very last question, Mr. Sullivan, a recent survey conducted by the UN Development Program found that 71% of respondents pointed to an adverse interaction with state security forces as the factor that was the tipping point in their decision to join terrorist organizations. Aside from Leahy vetting and human rights training, in what ways is the administration seeking to ensure that partner militaries accused of human rights violations pursue tangible measures of accountability for such actions? As I testified earlier, accountability, not just vetting of the organizations that particular military units or police units, but accountability, investigation, prosecution, and accountability by the government of those units is a key part of our program to ensure we're not enabling uh, organizations that violate human rights and not only it just are completely counter to our uh, our mission, which is to eliminate uh, the terrorist threat rather than create, as the t statistics you cite, having organizations that abuse people creates more terrorists rather than reducing the number of terrorists. I thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We go to Adam Kinsinger of Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I appreciate both of you being here today. I know it's probably the joy of your week to look forward to come in and testify in front of Congress, but we love having you here, and thanks for your service to your country. Um, <clears throat> a couple of quick points, and then I'll get to my questions. Um, the, the issue of Libya was brought up earlier by my good friend, and uh, I do want to make the point, because I think it's lost a lot. People say, well, look at Libya. Intervention in Libya failed. I think it was the post-Libya intervention that failed. I think when you take out leadership and then you basically walk away from a country, there's no doubt you're going to have issues with governance. But I do like to point out the fact that compare Libya to Syria. In Libya, as difficult as it is right now and as challenging as it is, there's not half a million dead Libyans right now. And there's not a generation that's being churned into refugee camps to the great extent that Syria is. Um, so I think when you compare the idea of intervention and you look at Libya and you look at Syria, um, I would much rather have Syria look like Libya than Libya look like Syria. I think it's an important point. It, it doesn't mean we didn't fail at follow-up. I think follow-up, we did fail. We basically walked away and, base, and said, here, fix it. The other point, I, I think, and I know it's kind of an uh, aggressive way to say it, but I think it's important I think this fight on terror, this war on terror, is basically the equivalent of a low-grade World War III. We're fighting an enemy all over the world. Uh, we've been, I'm a veteran of the wars, and, and uh, so that, you know, I've been in the military now 13 or 14 years, and I expect that probably the next generation to follow me is still going to have to fight this war to some extent. So, Mr. Sullivan, my question on that is when we look at Africa and we look at the Iron Curtain of Poverty, which I call it, and you look at this kind of lost opportunity. Today there's 15 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa where half of the population is under the age of 18. And combined with that tremendous youth, bul youth bulge is the fact that about 60% of Africa's unemployed are under the age of 25. And that demographic represents the prime recruiting pool for terrorist groups like Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab. Uh, I was in Kenya and saw uh, a USAID project where we build a a milk co-op, and frankly gave villages opportunity and hope. And they were extremely excited to meet me. They've never seen Adam Kinzinger, but they knew I was a guy from the United States Congress, and they knew that we changed our lives. 
and it's in villages like that, well, you'll never, ever be able to recruit an enemy against the United States. And so, Mr. Sullivan, that's where I consider your job especially important, is conflict mitigation in denying terrorist recruits around Africa. Uh, given that this administration has placed a huge priority in fighting terrorism, how is the State Department working to address underlying causes of radicalization, including lack of political opportunity, political marginalization, economic opportunity? Well, it's, uh, it's extremely important for all the reasons you say, and one thing that I would, I would point out and, uh, and emphasize a point you made, which is for our support, and I'm focused, I'm thinking now of particularly in programs in Iraq now, for large areas of Iraq that have been recovered from, uh, from ISIS, uh, we've found that the most effective programs are the small, are really small scale Large-scale projects, we've wasted huge amounts of money in, in Iraq, Afghanistan, elsewhere. Smaller-scale projects on the village level, and we've got a number of projects, a, a large number because they're, they're small, but they total almost $150 million, uh, for areas of Iraq that we need to contribute to stability so that internally displaced persons can go back but the focus has to be on the local level. These large macro projects, in my opinion, where we invest, have invested billions, it leads to corruption, graft, all of that. Focusing on the local level where there's a real impact on individual lives, that's where we need to spend. And that's where I hope maybe the State Department can do a better job of, in essence, bragging about those achievements because you know, a lot of, look, I'm fighting people in my own party, some that want to zero out the entire State Department, right? Um, and I think on the other side of the aisle, my friends over there sometimes think that any budget cut is going to lead to you know, chaos all around the globe. What we want to do is have a State Department that's efficient and effective. And, uh, and so I think those small-scale projects, conflict mitigation, a fight in a village in Iraq, for instance, that never happened because we brought two sides together and, and they learned to kind of live together is the stuff that we need to talk and brag about. Because I love DOD. I'm a member of DOD as a reservist. I just want to use them less. And uh, because when you have to use DOD, it gets really expensive and people lose their lives. And, uh, and frankly, me and my fellow pilots are kind of tired of having to deploy all the time. But they're really good at what they do. So I want to thank you both again for being here. And uh, I would just encourage you to always think, and the State Department to always think in terms of, and frankly, anybody listening, there is a lot of conflicts that are mitigated that we never hear about. And, uh, and I think it's extremely important that you guys get that message out so that the folks here sitting behind can uh, support it. So thank you, and I yield back. We go to uh, Lois Frankel of Florida. Thank you. Thank you to the witnesses for being here. Uh, my concerns that I want to talk to, to you about today is the I impact on uh, the women of the world, and I know specifically we're talking about Africa, <clears throat> with some of the current action or inaction of the State Department. And just to pick off, uh, pick up where Mr. Kissinger, some of his comments, <clears throat> which was that uh, the uh, population of Africa, over a billion, 60% under the age of 25, 40% living in poverty, and uh, obviously the poor go governance, corruption, uh, economic exclusion, and I want to pick up on the uh, weak health systems, all which lead to terrorism or the recruitment of especially young men to be terrorists. <clears throat> now, my concern is that uh, there has, seems to be an obsession on the uh, Republican side and our president with abortion. And because of that obsession, and the failure to recognize that the federal government does not fund abortion, that we have taken the gag rule too far, we have taken, we have defunded uh, programs at the UN which are cutting off health, reproductive uh, access to contraception, access to AIDS prevention, uh, to the women of these countries, which has a large impact on what goes on. I'm sure you would agree with that. So my, my question to you is, what are you doing about that? You, I, I think you were here one time, uh, or the Secretary Tillerson was here, 
He said there was going to be a review of the, of the global gag rule uh, to include assessments of any harm caused by the policy to women and the girls that receive U.S. global health as assistance. I think I asked uh, you about, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Sullivan, I asked you about the downgrading of the Office of Global Women's Issues. Uh, we still don't have an ambassador, and I am still, I'm concerned about that, so I'd like to have your comment on those issues. Um, I will have to get back to you on the effect of the gag rule. Uh, I will take that for the record, and I will get back to you. Uh, we have uh, the process uh, for selecting the ambassador, we identify the person, but then they have to go through vetting. It takes a while. That position is going to be filled. You have my word on that. What, 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 okay, well, so, I appreciate that. In the meantime, uh, what about downgrading uh, the uh, office? It used to, the office of, of, uh, used to report directly to the secretary. Right. Is that correct? Yes. And now, that position is going to be downgraded. Well, there were almost 70 offices, all of which reported directly to the secretary. So we've tried to rationalize the system so that the, each of those offices is placed in a bureau that would provide the support to that office because the secretary, the office of the secretary is small. It's one person. So I, we don't characterize it as a downgrade. Well, I, he, here's my concern it will be the ability of that Bureau that you're talking about, I, the issues that involve women are so diverse. You can't, it's very hard to just put them in one little pocket. I mean, you're dealing with economic uh, issues, you're dealing with gender equality, you're dealing obviously with health issues, with ch child marriage, with s sex trafficking, uh, labor trafficking, all those issues that go across a lot of different components of the State Department. How, I want to be assured that this bureau is going to be able to access all of those areas. Certainly, and it, on my trip to, to Africa and Nigeria, I saw all those issues. I went to, uh, to a hospital, to a clinic, a PEPFAR clinic that was HIV positive women with babies born to them, and because of PEPFAR, their babies are not HIV positive. Economic empowerment, Secretary Tillerson has discussed that. The value of a dollar invested in a woman yields so much more than, uh, than that it is, uh, it's really money well spent. All those issues you raise uh, are extremely important, and particularly for our subject here, which is Africa and counterterrorism in Africa. All right, well, just to let you know, we're gonna be watching that and hope for some Good progress. I yield back. Okay, uh, Mr. John Curtis Thank of you, Utah. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's been a, a theme uh, today expressed by a lot of my colleagues about human rights, and I, um, I don't want to burden us with further questions other than to express my own personal um, concern and interest in this and uh, appreciate your efforts um, along these lines. I would like to ask Dr. Uh, Trechtenberg uh, quickly in your Opening remarks, you said uh, African solutions to African problems. And I found myself wishing you had just a little bit more time to expand on that. W would you take just a minute and tell us what you meant by that? Uh, sure, Congressman. Uh, I think clearly it is not our role, it's certainly not the role of the Department of Defense, to determine the outcomes for other countries uh, in terms of governance, in terms of, uh, uh, in, in terms of, uh, some of the issues that have been talked about here that serve as the underlying issues that, that lead to radicalization uh, or, or, or terrorism. Uh, what we can do uh, and what we should be doing, what we are doing, is working with these countries to help provide a secure environment so that they can then uh, develop uh, and establish the forms of governance and uh, society uh, that are important to their growth economically, uh, politically, uh, and what have you. We're not trying to impose our solutions on others is really what I meant there. Uh, the, the Africa is a diverse, large and diverse continent, over 50 countries there. Uh, it's. It's absolutely huge, and the history of those countries, the cultures, uh, 
are all different. Uh, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get at the, the problem that we're talking about here, uh, countering terrorism and extremism in order to provide a security setting where others, like the Department of State, can come in and help assist those countries develop their own indigenous solutions, uh, keeping in mind that each starts from a, from a different place, historically, culturally, and, and, and what have you. That's, that's really what I meant. We're not trying to impose a solution on that. All right. I think it caught my attention because I think that's frequently an error uh, we make in lots of problems, and, and I wanted to emphasize that. Thank you. I yield my time. Okay. We have Ted Liu of California. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for calling this important hearing. I appreciate it. And thank you, uh, Secretary Sullivan, Secretary Trackenberg, for your service. Did I pronounce that right, sir? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. I'd first like to uh, start off uh, asking you, Deputy Trackenberg, in your written testimony, you stated that we need a whole of government approach to defeat terrorism. Uh, does that include the State Department? Oh, absolutely. And I just want to say that the proposed massive cuts by Secretary Tillerson to State Department, as well as President Trump's failure to nominate individuals for high-level State Department positions, have hurt U.S. national security. If those things are not corrected, it will further hurt U.S. national security. So, Mr. Chair, I'd like to enter for the record a letter uh, to Secretary Mattis dated March 10th, 2017. Thank you. Uh, this letter, is from national security experts and former government officials from across the political spectrum. And in it, they state that even small numbers of unintentional civilian deaths or injuries, whether or not legally permitted, can cause significant strategic setbacks. For example, civilian deaths from U.S. operations can cause partners and allies to reduce operational collaboration, withdraw consent, and limit intelligence sharing increase violence for militant groups and foster distrust among local populations. I support the Department of Defense operations around the world to go after terrorists. I serve an active duty in the military. When it comes to terrorists, I believe we should hunt them down and kill them. But we should also protect civilians because it will harm our U.S. national security if we don't. So I've seen troubling rises in civilian casualties across DOD operations, such as, for example, in Operation Inherent Resolve. This is not a partisan issue. That started under the Obama administration. Civilian casualties started rising. It continues today. The New York Times did a, a very large expose on that. And I have before me uh, two Daily Beast articles. I'd like to enter for the record uh, as well at the appropriate time. And the first one, is dated November 29, 2017. It's titled, Strong Evidence That U.S. Special Operations Forces Massacred Civilians in Somalia. The second is dated December 6, 2017, saying, on the eve of congressional hearings, new evidence about alleged U.S. massacre in Somalia. And what the Daily Beast articles say is they did an investigation and they state that uh, U.S. Special Forces killed unarmed civilians in Somalia on August 25th. We've been in contact with uh, Africa Command. Uh, they uh, deny that, and they say they've done an assessment. Uh, their assessment is that uh, those casualty figures are incorrect, that everyone that was killed was essentially an enemy combatant. So my question for you is, is there gonna be any further investigation or assessment, or is that, is that it? Is, is there gonna be any further? Uh, Congressman Liu, uh, my understanding of that incident uh, and AFRICOM's response is precisely the way uh, you have described it. Uh, I do want to make clear uh, that we in the Department of Defense take any accusations of civilian casualties very seriously, and we work to avoid them at all costs. Uh, you're correct, AFRICOM recently uh, conducted and concluded an assessment into this particular incident. Uh, the key finding from that uh, was that the only casualties suffered uh, were those of, en uh, of armed enemy combatants who had fired upon U.S. and Somali forces, uh, and that the allegations of civilian 
casualty, uh, uh, the uh, charges of civilian casualties uh, were not credible. I will be uh, happy to look into uh, your question in terms of will there be a follow-on to this, uh, but as the information I have as of this time supports uh, the conclusions of AFRICOM that you have yeah. mentioned. Thank you. So in light of this new Daily Beast article dated December 6, where they uh, provide additional evidence, I strongly urge the Department of Defense to conduct a further investigation as to what actually happened on August 25th. I will take that back. Thank you. I have a limited time remaining, so uh, let me uh, just again say that I want to thank uh, both you and Secretary Sullivan for your public service and appreciate you being here today. Congressman Darrell Issa of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Sullivan, uh, uh, I'm going to direct my questions primarily to you. Uh, currently, uh, to use a term, you're dual-hatted. You're You've got the management portfolio and the conventional deputy, correct? That's correct. Okay, and uh, in your opinion, well, let me rephrase that. The continent of Africa and its billion people uh, have a number of problems we've talked about today, including uh, a number of terrorist groups who now are aligning themselves with ISIS, obviously human trafficking and the like. Uh, it was mentioned in opening statements that the, uh, uh, the Department of Defense's budget to combat this is roughly equal to your budget. Uh, this is an area of great threat. It's a, larger than the United States, meaning that relief efforts for our men and women, uh, your men and women of the State Department and affiliated organizations, uh, basically it's tough. Benghazi was the closest point to Europe practically, and a relief effort took more than 13 hours. So I want to go through a couple of questions related to, if you will, your management uh, hat as deputy. Uh, I was recently, uh, Thanksgiving weekend, I was in Zimbabwe for the change uh, that you, ha you only get once every 37 years, so you take it when you can. Uh, and I want to thank the State Department for working so hard to make that uh, mission possible. Uh, I also toured the new facility there. Uh, $220 million facility arriving on time uh, later the, uh, next year. But I noticed that, first of all, it was, it's an expensive facility. Uh, it was built at twice the size of our existing facility. And it was built based on a, uh, a decision made during the last administration, which was to give up the standard design, in other words, builds that are cookie cutters that allow for faster and less expensive facilities. Since this committee and the appropriators give you a limited amount of money, that facility, which took a long time, cost $220 million, is an exception to the otherwise aging facilities that don't meet Inman standards, that are not safe, and they are, many of them are in Africa. Um, and although this structure is beautiful and it has architect, by the way, it has completely curved walls, continuously curved walls, which turns out to be really hard to do uh, and a little bit impractical. So what will you be doing to return to a process in which the dollars the American people invest specifically in facilities and security go further, particularly in dangerous areas like Africa? Uh, a very important uh, question, uh, Congressman Issa, and it's, it's a phenomenon that we have seen, I've seen in the seven months that I've been in office, where the length of time it takes for an embassy to be, site to be picked, uh, plans developed, built, and so forth, our mission will often change. For example, in Iraq, we built an enormous embassy in Iraq. Much of it we don't need now. Uh, so there's a lot we, we've had a... I, I was also in Baghdad right. a couple weeks earlier, and uh, what, you, what you need is an overhead cover from things dropping into that embassy. Uh, so it's very important. It's part of the Secretary's redesign, looking at, uh, at OBO and our planning for embassies. It's a huge amount of money as a part of our budget that we spend. Uh, and I've spoken to our IG about this, IG investigations and how we've been spending money. Very important issue, particularly if... As, as we've discussed a lot today, uh, the State Department budget getting cut or, uh, or whether it will, making sure that those dollars we spend on our embassies are spent uh, effectively to promote the safety of our women and men, 
but also that we have the right-sized embassy, right-sized building for the post we need. So it's fair to say that one of the challenges is these lead times under these custom designs are so long yes. that often what you end up with is not what you need by that time. Eventually, that's right. Uh, uh, obviously, you're still looking at Britain. We'll talk offline <laughs> at the problems of that billion-dollar-plus facility. Uh, but one of the other last questions is, would you consider bringing to this committee for authorization a, a, a revised grand plan of how you get to where every facility, at least in what we, we would call high stress or, or dangerous areas, can be upgraded in a timely fashion? In other words, I know with your budget, you're, you're looking out decades. Uh, and you know where Papua New Guinea is getting one, places in Africa are not. Would you consider bringing to us a comprehensive proposal and then allowing that increased speed with which you will be able to do it if you return to a standard design platform so that this committee could consider the additional funds leaped ahead to get us from a very dangerous area in which the next Benghazi could happen at any time to an area in which the men and women who go around the world on behalf of us could be secure? Uh, and, Chairman, I appreciate the time, but I, I'd hope the Secretary could answer. Yeah, not only would I consider it, I'd welcome it uh, and look forward to having that, that conversation with you and members of the committee, including on our embassy in London. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Adriana, Adriano Espiat. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Engels. Uh, thank you for coordinating this hearing on the U.S. efforts to counter terrorism in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. I'm glad both the State Department and the Department of Defense are here uh, today. Given uh, the October ambush of U.S. military personnel in Niger, which took the lives of four uh, U.S. soldiers, including uh, Army Sergeant Lata B. Johnson, David Johnson, whose body was found days after the attack, uh, as well as the expansion of Boko Haram across Nigeria's borders and even the current uh, slave auction crisis in Libya. Uh, I think that all these uh, warrant a more robust approach, more funding, more efforts, uh, both by the St State Department and the Department of Defense to expand its regional uh, counterterrorism assistance uh, programs in Africa. Uh, we need to be investing more in our peacekeeping operation and other State Department's efforts like USAID this is necessary not just in Africa, but in the rest of the world as well. Yet we've seen the Department of Defense expand its own engagement in Sub-Saharan Africa and has spent over $1.7 billion for counterterrorism purposes in the past 10 years. As Secretary of Defense Mattis said, if we, if we don't fund the State Department fully, then we need to buy more ammunition, ultimately, and, and that is beginning to play itself out as we proceed with this major proposed cuts. And we see that there is plenty of truth to that statement. And so why would the State Department cut its own budget? Uh, I want to, uh, Mr. Sullivan, go right straight to a question, which has really been troubling me uh, for a long, long time, because this crisis, the kidnap of the girls by Boko Haram, which, and I must commend uh, Congresswoman Wilson for sort of keeping the eye on the ball on that issue. Uh, once it left the, the media, it has somewhat been buried. And what is the status of these girls that are still held captives by Boko Haram? How many of them do we know uh, if there's a possibility to rescue them, to get them back? What is the current status of the girls kidnapped by Boko Haram? Uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, a, a topic, an important issue for my trip to Nigeria. Uh, at our embassy in Nigeria, and it may have left uh, left the front pages of the newspapers here in the United States, but it certainly not left uh, the uh, the uh, the the embassy in Nigeria, which is focused very acutely on this. Um, there were approximately three, as you know, approximately 300 mm -hmm. uh, young women who were uh, who were ab were abducted. Some of whom have been uh, been rescued or released or escaped. Uh, but there's a huge number that are still unknown. Uh, we don't know where they are. We suspect that they are uh, they're still held captive. They may have been uh, 
uh, given as, as, as brides. Uh, it's something that both the United States and the Nigerian government is focused very acutely on. I met with our security staff at the embassy. I met with our local staff, local Nigerians, who came up to me when I did a town hall to tell me how important it was to them that we are not forgetting about them and we're still working to track them and do all we can to, uh, to rescue them. Uh, it's just, just baffle me, baffles me that, you know, we, we can probably put a, a man or a woman in Mars soon and we can't find out where these girls are. I'm just very concerned that uh, it may be too little too late when we, when, when we get to them. So I would encourage uh, both the State Department and the Department of Defense to continue robustly, uh, robustly looking for them. On the uh, slave auction matter, which is a horrible modern slave uh, trade story, is there anything you can share with us on that? And what is the magnitude of it? Uh, who is involved in it? Who, who are the slave owners in this? We want to know who, who's engaged in this. Is there any, any country or any uh, sector of, of a society in a country that's uh, acutely and vigorously involved in this and benefiting from this? So the, uh, the focus is in ungoverned areas in Libya. And I've already committed to get back to the committee with a report on more intelligence, specific intelligence that we could provide in a closed setting on what we know about those who are, uh, are involved. But I'd, I'd say the central problem is that these camps are in ungoverned areas, mm -hmm. in enormous countries with ungoverned areas. And that also may explain why, to our first point that we discussed about the young women who are still missing, there are ungoverned areas where we don't have a lot of access or intelligence, so it's something we need to work on. What with. about our allies? For example, Italy seems to be very concerned uh, with the uh, outlawedness of uh, Libya, and, and they're having a, a, a serious migration issue in, Li in Italy and across Europe, I may add, because Italy will be the port of entry uh, for that migration coming from Libya. Do they have any... Uh, intelligence? Do they have any information about this? I've met with the Carabinieri, actually the, the head of the Carabinieri, to discuss the immigration problem from Libya. This was several months ago. Uh, Italy has a very close relationship with uh, a number of uh, uh, groups in Libya and uh, will, is, I'm sure, a source of intelligence that we can rely on. We uh, need to move to... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For Thank that. you very much, sir. We need to move to uh, Tom Garrett of Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go relatively quickly unless I address you, Mr. Trachtenberg. I apologize. My question is directed to the Deputy Secretary. I would hope that you would appreciate the fact that I have a finite amount of time. And if it's a yes or no question, give a yes or no answer. On the Sudan, I've also been there. I would commend this administration for the progress made in that country. And I point that out by virtue of the fact that we've heard so many doom and gloom stories from those who don't understand the Vandenberg concept that politics stops at the water edge. Is Sudan historically in the last 30 years been a kind of bad actor? Yes. And, and so have they also been listed on the state sponsors of terror list? They still are. At some point they were accused of harboring a guy named Osama bin Laden, correct? They did indeed. Okay, and they harbored FBI bomb plotters as, as well back in the 90s, correct? Many bad actors. And so when I was there, I had the opportunity to meet with Mr. Atta, who heads NIST there, a very powerful man, and was encouraged by some of the words and deeds. Uh, and while there's a long way to go yet, we are making progress at advancing human rights, religious freedom, and reducing their role in terror in the Republic of the Sudan. Is that a fair assessment? That is. And so would you say that's the success story of this administration on foreign policy? Uh, partial success, yes. Sure, there's a lot left to do. And so you've also spoken to the reduction in funds as it relates to successive programs on small scales, things like school feeding programs and water purifications in villages, correct? This, the need for those and this, the, the, lo, the small scale uh, programs are the most effective. It's a lot easier to lose money when we spend lots of it than it is when we, when we address a specific issue, correct? Well said. Okay. And so I've been a champion of things like school feeding programs. I would point out and ask you if you agree that there's a reduction in long-term radicalization where we see women get educations. Is that an accurate statement? I don't think anybody could deny that. And there's, a, and there's an increase in economic achievement where we see school feeding programs and, 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 and articulate educated women as well, correct? I would think so. And these are things like McGovern Dole feeding programs that aren't mass programs, but that we should spread out as small programs. They work, right? Yes. Okay, so this is just a history for me. Um, 
I spoke briefly earlier of Arthur Vandenberg. Are you familiar with Arthur Vandenberg? I am. Okay, and so you're aware that Mr. Vandenberg was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and was running against Truman, we thought, when he was encouraged to attack Mr. Truman on foreign policy matters. Are you familiar with the story? I am. And Mr. Vandenberg said, I simply won't do that because politics should stop at the water's edge. Yes. Okay. I am disheartened by the fact that that doesn't appear to be the case today. I was taken aback and, in fact, wrote down the words verbatim of a member previously who said, and I quote, wherever you go, anywhere in the world, people from state pull you aside and tell you how upset they are, how they feel like the administration is really going after State Department. Uh, did you hear that testimony earlier? Does that sound familiar? Uh, I believe a member said that, yes. Okay. I, I, what I, I would submit is that this is actually the State Department going after the administration. So let me ask you this. The people in state who are complaining that the administration is going after them, who elected them? Uh, employees at the State Department or civil service and foreign So they're not elected by the yeah. people of the United States. And, and, and who are they held accountable to? Uh, they're held accountable to their, the secretary. And, and he works for? The president of the United okay. States. Okay. And is policy making vested in the individuals who complain about um, how they're being treated by the administration? Uh, I, 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 they're not policy makers, correct? They're executioners of policy? I, it, it's hard for me to answer that because they defining who a policy maker Well, I'll submit this. I wore the uniform of the United States military for a number of years, and oftentimes I was told to do things that I didn't necessarily agree with on my ideological scale, but so long as they were lawful orders that didn't violate the international laws governing the actions of military force, I executed those orders without complaining to members of Congress when they showed up, say, for example, in the dining facility at Camp Doble in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And so I would ask you if you would be willing to convey to the members of the State Department that they were not elected, that they are not policymakers, that they are executioners of policy, and so long as the policy that they're asked to execute does not violate international laws, that they should do their jobs or find some other place to go. Now, I say that with respect and regard to the fine professional individuals from the State Department who helped me extract nine Christian refugees from the Republic of the Sudan earlier this year. There are wonderful people at State. But when an administration changes, it is not your job to grab us by the sleeve and complain that you don't think the president's treating you well. It is your job, as Tennyson said, to do your job. And finally, are you familiar with the statement made earlier in this hearing where an individual said, it seems to be a Republican obsession with abortion? Do you recall that, test, that, that question, line of questioning? I believe so, yes. Okay. I would submit that perhaps it's not an obsession with abortion, but an obsession with protecting the preeminent God-given human right, which is the right to life. And I would submit that the obsession is on the part of those who believe that U.S. foreign policy hinges on funding abortions of people in the developing world. And so, candidly, I thank you for the good work you're doing. I appreciate the progress we're making in places like the Republic of the Sudan. I appreciate the great help that we've received from people in the State Department. But if you don't agree with the policy coming out of the administration, please convey that to the members of the staff that might disagree. They should run for president. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we go to Mr. Bradley Schneider of Illinois. Uh, thank you, and again, thank you to the witnesses for uh, spending your time with us today and, and sharing your perspective. Uh, I am uh, likewise going to spend most of my time with you, Mr. Sullivan, no disrespect uh, to Mr. Trachtenberg. But there is uh, many reports out that uh, there are many open vacancies within the State Department that we have, just as an example, the ambassador to South Korea is, is vacant. There is reports out that morale is low, and you're hearing it from former policymakers who would know and, and ha have a perspective. Uh, we are managing in a world at a time when there is ever-increasing danger, ever-increasing complexity, managing a larger, growing significant number of priorities with a smaller staff and a, a requested smaller budget. So my question uh, to you, Mr. Sullivan, is as you look at the world, as the State Department looks at the world, as you're trying to manage your resources, what priorities have had to be moved to the outer ring or the back burner? Mr. Sullivan, are you sure the uh, the button is my, pushed there? My apologies. It's my for, I usually forget to do that more often in the hearing. It's my first error. I, I apologize. Um, we've defined our priorities as uh, protecting the United States, promoting security of the United States, uh, and also promoting U.S. economic prosperity. Two principal uh, two principal goals of of this administration. Uh, everything else flows from that supporting our allies, uh, 
working to address threats, whether it's the DPRK. So let me reclaim my time, because, um, and I appreciate that in protecting the United States, promoting yep. our interests, I would posit is more of a mission statement than priorities. Right. Within that, priorities are, there are places around the world where we're going to dedicate more resources, whether it's working to make progress in Sudan, which I commend you for the progress that, that has been made. But we have concerns about what's happening in North Korea. We have concerns about losing ground to Iraq, in, or to Iran rather, in Syria and Iraq and Yemen. We have concerns about what's happening in uh, Latin America. The best way to fail is to try to do everything all at once with unlimited resources. We don't have unlimited resources. We are pulling back resources. And so I would hope that within the broad context of the world with increasing uh, challenges, we are putting at the top of the list, the most significant, most important priorities, but with limited resources, some have to drop. So my question is, what priorities are being pushed down the list because of loss of personnel, lack of resources, decisions to, to say that this is not uh, where we're gonna put our, our resources today? Well, there's a process that's managed by the, by the White House, the National Security Council, uh, to prioritize our security and our foreign policy uh, and that process is ongoing in this first year of the administration. Uh, it's hard for me to say th there, isn't a, there isn't a process that says we're not going to do X, Y, or Z, and it's hard for me sitting here to say we're not going to do something because we do have posts, you know, we're in 190 countries, we cover the world, so we do cover everywhere. Right. And, uh, so and it's difficult for me to answer. I, 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 I better you. get the thrust yeah. of your I question. Mean, the, the, the concern, and I think this has been shared by many others with far more experience in foreign policy than I have, including former secretaries of state, is that with the decision not to fill spots, with the decision not to commit resources, we are putting at risk some of our interests and, and putting at risk uh, Americans. But I, I want to change gears for one second and go back to a conversation you had with my colleague from Rhode Island. He asked you about uh, the report on uh, the, in the context of the Child Soldiers Prevention Act, and, and you asserted uh, to Mr. Cicilline that the memo and the decision to exclude three countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Burma, followed that. But there is a, um, through the proper channel, the dissent channel, a, um, a memo that says that that was not correct, that these three countries, Afghanistan, Burma, uh, and Iraq, have recruited, have used child soldiers, and um, with, without, um, uh, uh, if it's okay, I'd like to have this included in the record, but uh, could you touch on that a little bit? Sure, I'm, I'm aware of the, the, dis, the dissent channel uh, message that, uh, that, that you have mentioned. My description was the process that the secretary went through uh, six months ago uh, when, the, when that decision was made, what, what he did. There's been a subsequent dissent channel message, which which you have, which the department responds to, uh, and I don't know, given the timing, whether the department has submitted a response to that. But the usual process is that there is a response from the department when a dissent channel message comes in, because we take those very seriously. Okay, and, and again, it just emphasized the concern that um, uh, the secretary is is not listening to some of the people who are in the field who have an understanding. This was abroad. This wasn't just a few people. There were many people who signed on to this dissent memo. And without objection, I would ask that this is included in the record. Without objection. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Steve Shabbat of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I first of all want to apologize for not being here for most of your testimony here. Uh, Today we had the uh, FBI director and judiciary and had to be over there for that and, and came back. But uh, um, since she's still here, I'd like to give credit to my colleague from Illinois, uh, Robin Kelly, uh, for uh, introducing along with myself some legislation a while back, the Protecting Girls Access to Education Act, which passed this committee, thanks to the chairman, Chairman Royce here, and went to the floor and passed the full House of Representatives and the Senate is considering it right now. We hope we'll get this to the president's desk. And in essence, what uh, this does is it says that in conflict areas, and God knows we have those in Africa, um, obviously Somalia comes to mind and, and, and others, um, it seems like a good idea to prioritize uh, education and, and emphasizing that for, for children, especially girls, but boys as well. Um, so that we are able to uh, uh, give them the opportunity, alternatives to the extremism that exists, uh, obviously oftentimes radical 
uh, Islamic fundamentalist extremism, but other extremisms as well, and uh, abuse that occurs, uh, a whole range of abuses. And uh, so I, I think it's great legislation. I want to, uh, once again, publicly uh, uh, thank uh, Ms. Kelly for her leadership on that, that issue. And would just ask the State Department, um, are, are you aware of the legislation? Um, are you considering the implementation of it once it uh, is passed by the Senate and signed by the President? And uh, are there other education uh, initiatives that the State Department currently has that could be uh, beefed up in conflict areas to, uh, uh, to help to, and, and obviously, you know, that, this is only one small aspect when you're talking about the overall battle against extremism. But uh, Mr. Solomon, if you could just comment. Um, I'm aware of, this, of, the, uh, of the bill. I don't know that there has been a, a SAP or an administration or even a department view on it. It sounds like a terrific idea to me, but that's just me speaking. Yeah. I'd be happy to uh, take that back and, and seek more formal views for for that uh, for for both of you. Yeah, we'll make sure that our personal staffs and the committee staff get with the State Department folks and make sure that you're ready when it passes. I understand that there's lots, thousands of bills that get uh, right. uh, introduced all the time. This one actually made it <laughs> through the floor. It's bipartisan. I think it has a great chance over in the Senate and sure. uh, would be at least play a small role. Um, Mr. Mr. Spayot before was talking about a couple of things that I've also over the years been concerned about, and I know the public has been, seems that there's an ebb and flow when the media is interested in it, people find out about it, they think it's horrible, they want to do something about it, you hear it for a few days or a few weeks and then it kind of goes away. Um, and one of those is, the, is obviously Boko Haram and the kidnapping of the 300 girls. And you already, you already uh, you know, talked about it some, at some length, but uh, I, I I share his frustration on this, and I'm, you expressed that also, Mr. Sullivan, so I'm not going to, again, uh, go into it at any great le length, but there's, there's a whole, you know, the, the things which happen in Africa which are just, uh, you know, horrific. The Lord's Army with Joseph Coney is another one that got the attention of people on the Internet for a while there, but ultimately, what happened? Did they bring the guy to justice? Did they destroy the army, et, et cetera? And, and there was a military aspect to this, so I don't know if, you, Mr. Trachtenberg, if you wanted to talk a bit about what we're doing um, r relative to these types of uh, groups that are a danger not only to those countries, but can, because they do cooperate with terrorist groups, whether it's uh, ISIS or anybody else. Um, if you could just talk about how the, our military forces are, are engaging, and maybe you're fine, or more active on that than perhaps we once were. Uh, well, Congressman, uh, just generally, uh, let me re-emphasize uh, the, the point that uh, our engagements with uh, partner countries uh, are done to bolster, primarily to bolster their capacities right. to provide for, for their own security and to deal with situations uh, such, such as the one you described. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that what DOD does uh, and uh, how DOD operates, we are, we are essentially an enabler. Uh, and I say that, in fact, I would say we are a double enabler. Uh, on the one hand, uh, our operations with partner countries are designed to enable their forces, their militaries, to provide security and to deal with the threats that, that they face. Uh, I say we're a double enabler because, on the other hand, I, I think what we are doing and attempting to do helps to enable our interagency partners as well, including the State Department. Uh, 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 the uh, issue of uh, NGOs was mentioned earlier. Uh, but that is critically important, and I think uh, the one thing that, I, uh, that I'm taking away from, from this hearing so far uh, is, is the clear emphasis uh, on the need for and sort of an intergovernmental approach to dealing with these issues. It, 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 is, it is crystal clear. Our role is a, is a part of that at DOD, but by in no means uh, an, exclusive, uh, an, an exclusive role. Exactly right. If I could just conclude, that's why it's so important, I think, that our military folks and our State Department work together and the ultimate is what's in the best interest of the U.S., and that generally is, we get constituents that will communicate, you know, why do you care about filling the country, you know, you, you need to be working here. Those things that happen over there can affect us 
right here and oftentimes for our militaries involved it's a relatively small number of people and we're working to make those indigenous uh, forces able to handle the terrorism so that it's over there and dealt with and not here on American soil. And yes, sir. Back. Thank you. Robin Kelly of Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my colleague. I did want to follow up on what my colleague said because we had a meeting with Ambassador Haley, and she talked about despite all the suffering, the hunger, the sexual assaults, and on and on and on when they asked the particularly the young people, what they want, and they say in education. So they see that as their ticket out of you know, that, that situation. Uh, the United States and the government of uh, Niger recently agreed upon a memorandum of understanding that would allow the DLD to arm U.S. drones currently stationed in that country. And yet AFRICOM has stated the U.S. military does not have an active direct combat mission in Niger. There seems to be a disconnect in some way. What is the timeline for arming U.S. drones in that country, and how and under what authorities will they be used? And either one of you or both of you can answer. Uh, I, I cannot address the specifics of that question here, uh, Congresswoman, but I'd, I'd be happy to take that one for the record. Okay, thank you. And then Mr. Sullivan, many of the security cooperation programs and activities include State Department involvement in the decision-making process. Given all the vacancies that we've talked about over and over in the State Department, do you feel the state is having its voice heard during the interagency process? Do you feel like there's enough people there to speak at the table? Yes, and it, to, to address, it, address your question in two ways. First, um, specifically at post, where there's coordination between the ambassador, the chief of mission, and the U.S. military in Africa would be AFRICOM. Uh, there's been uh, extraordinary cooperation uh, between, for example, our ambassador to Libya uh, and General Waldhauser. Uh, so at post, I think there's, and it's something that both Secretary Mattis and Secretary Tillerson stress a lot to everyone who works for them. So I think that's filtered down through the chain. Uh, our voice in the interagency here in Washington uh, is something that I'm largely responsible for participating in the deputies committee meetings at the, uh, at the White House along with my, my colleague and, and partner here, uh, Under Secretary Trachtenberg. Um, but the question, your, your question really gets to why we need those positions filled and I, I want to correct a misimpression. We in this administration, we in the State Department are not, uh, we're not seeking, we're not, we didn't set out to leave these positions unfilled. We haven't done a good job of filling them for a number of reasons, including uh, slow in picking nominees, uh, slow in getting them through the vetting process, and then we run into the challenges with the, uh, the Foreign Relations Committee. So I discussed with another member earlier, I forget who asked or cited a figure that 50% of the slots uh, are unfilled. I'd say probably of that 50%, uh, 40% we have a person identified. For example, I can't announce the person's name because the person hasn't been announced yet, but we have a person picked to be our ambassador to South Korea, but they haven't gone through the clearance, and they've been in the clearance process, it seems like, forever. Okay. I wanted to ask specifically uh, for the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership, is funding, and, is funding and attention still being focused towards justice sector support, counter-radicalization programs and public diplomacy efforts, and are there any successes that you would like to share? Because I do agree with what my colleague from Illinois said that people need to hear more about, you know, the good things and the successes. I'll have to get back to you with that to, to provide, I want to provide precise okay. information, numbers and facts, which I have, a, I have an impression, but I want to give you precise information. So if I could, I'll take Fine. that for the record and, and get back okay. to you. And I yield back and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We, we go to uh, Dina Titus of Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you for being here. I, 
serve, uh, in addition to being on this committee, which I enjoy very much and I value, I'm a member of the House Democracy Partnership. And we work with our legislative colleagues around the world in developing democracies, including Kenya and Tunisia, to help build democratic institutions and encourage civic engagement. Our work, though, has to be backed up by USAID and the State Department. So when we see those programs being diminished, that hurts what we're trying to do. My colleague from Virginia seemed to suggest that the people who are concerned about what's happening in the State Department are just a bunch of carping employees, and that is certainly not the case. I meet with diplomats and parliamentarians from around the world, and they consistently, no matter where they are from, tell me how concerned they are about the U.S.'s diminished role in world diplomacy. So I, I want you to know that we believe those are real concerns, and we are hearing them not just from employees of the State Department, but from world leaders in all parts, from all parts of the globe. I, I have a specific question, though, and uh, either one of you can answer, and I appreciate it. Earlier this year, uh, the U.S. decided to terminate what was called Operation Observant Compass. That was to counter the Lord's Resistance Army in Central Africa. And I'm curious to hear if that decision has created a security vacuum in that part of the world where the U.S. military used to operate, and if that security vacuum has led to an increase in poaching and illegal ivory trade and trafficking. In November, the President and our Interior Secretary Zinke announced uh, the administration's reversal of a ban on the importation of ivory that came from Zambia and Zimbabwe. That has been stopped, thank goodness, and I commend our chairman for weighing in on that and thank him very much. But we know that there's been shown a link between illegal poaching and ivory traffic to uh, gain funds to support terrorism. Just wish you two would comment on that and see if there's anything being done about it. Uh, Congresswoman, let me start uh, on uh, the uh, uh, termination of uh, Operation Observant uh, uh, Compass. Um, uh, there's little that I can say uh, to you on that other than it's my impression uh, that it, uh, it has not created a, a security vacuum, but I do not have the details here uh, and would be happy to go back and uh, try to gather a little more information on that. Thank you. I'd appreciate it. Um, I just add that one of the, uh, the factors that we considered in our decision to partially lift sanctions on Sudan mm -hmm. was the government of Sudan's cooperation in our pursuit of the LRA. Uh, I defer to DOD on where that stands, but the other point I'd make is transnational criminal organizations, those that traffic uh, the way you describe, they do support terrorism, and they're a, they're a scourge, and uh, we need to address them. Do you have any specific plans to do that? or? Well, we have, for example, for narcotics trafficking, yeah. uh, we have uh, in Western Hemisphere, we have a number of programs, INL or Bureau at the uh, State Department, a number of programs address that. But in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, wildlife trafficking uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, is, a, is a problem that you've identified. Uh, I can't say that we've devoted all that we should to address it, but it is not just a crime and, a tr and, and uh, participated in by transnational criminal organizations, but that money finds its way to bad actors who harm us in other ways. Well, I'd like to see you take a little more effort to address that, because I think it was, uh, as you say, that if that's funding some of these terrorist activities, you'd be doing well by doing good. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. We go to Mr. Brad Sherman of California. Mm. Mr. Sullivan, it, uh, your, your department spends pennies compared to Mr. Trottenberg's department spending dollars when are we, and it, it, one of the major efforts of your department is that we don't have failed states. When, you do, we are, when we're successful in that, then Mr. Trottenberg doesn't need to get involved. Um, which is why I'd point out that when it comes to our foreign aid, we gave foreign aid to Germany and France in the 40s. Today they're donor countries. We gave foreign aid to Taiwan and South Korea in the following decades. 
Um, seems like foreign aid might be a, a very good investment. Um, the uh, one thing I'd like to focus on on foreign aid is that in many countries, and I don't have a, a list in front of me, if you want to send your kids to school, you got to pay for the books. Now, that's the rule at American colleges, but it's the rule uh, in first grade in a lot of countries. And it occurs to me, and I hope you'll go back and look at this, that if we paid for the books, first, we'd have some say in the content. I'm not saying that you ask the San Francisco School Board to tell you what the content should be, but we would have some say in the, in the content. And second, it's kind of hard to steal a book, especially in a country where, due to the generosity of the United States, school books are free. What are you going to do if you steal the book? So, uh, whereas almost er so many other things. And then the third thing uh, in foreign aid is what I call flag on the bag. We often give bags of food, and often I've talked to foreign aid workers, and they say, look, we're giving food to people, but one out of 20 people we're dealing with hate the United States. So if we put the flag on the bag, we got a problem, we got this, we got it. so they hide it. Whereas, and of course, they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, you put the, if, if we're paying for the books, gift to the people of the United States right there on the front page, uh, you know, even if somebody crosses it out, that just emphasizes it. So I hope you'll, 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 you'll go back and, and look at that, um, both in terms of books is a good way to invest. And I realize that I'm old-fashioned. I books, paper, you know, the, 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 the same concept would apply. With I was having that same thought. I yeah. prefer books, but they'll probably want tablets. Uh, yeah. There's still <laughs> millions exactly. and millions of dollars that people, poor people in Africa are paying to buy paper books. Uh, for this, so their kids can go to elementary school. Um, let's see, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Trottenberg, um, uh, the previous administration public released uh, both the presidential policy guidance uh, establishing procedures uh, for approving direct action against terrorist targets and a comprehensive report on the legal and policy frameworks guiding uh, the use of military force. Do these documents uh, reflect uh, the current administration's policies? If anything has changed, uh, will you release updated versions of these public documents? Uh, uh, Congressman, I appreciate the question. I would like to get uh, back to you, if I might, with, with a more uh, uh, definitive answer on, on that. Um, you're burdened by the fact that I've been here a long time, and every time almost every time someone says that, I get back a nonsense answer. Well, Something I like, like says, Congressman, we want to assure you we're dedicated to helping the American people in the world. How comprehensive and clear and definitive is your future answer going to be? Uh, that is, uh, I understand the question, Congressman. Uh, I do not have the information now to be able to provide you with a detailed answer. Can you that commit you, to a detailed, clear, and I, definitive answer I can commit, in a reasonable amount of time? I can commit to go back and to find the answer to the question and, and see what can be provided to you. <laughs> you can see why asking me to accept your non-answer is subject to, uh, to some concern. Uh, I, I don't think that we subpoenaed you here. I don't think we can force you to answer a question, but I think it, uh, the people in this room are aware that you're, refusing, that you're not willing to answer the question now, and they'll all be looking for your written answer. A part of it, Congressman, is uh, I think uh, what, you, what you're asking for is a, is a level of detail that I am not yet, uh, 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 that I do not yet have a full understanding. Okay. Now, I what, I, like what I hope that you don't, do is say, oh, it's classified, because you can get us a classified answer too. But I'll point out that the government of the United States has officially released the fact that there are five to 6,000 U.S. troops in Africa, and uh, um, there's a host of other, uh, either widely, you know, widely reported by respectable sources or officially reported. And uh, so I hope, uh, and we'll, uh, can you get back to me within two weeks? I'm happy to work with you and your staff to, to get back to you with uh, uh, an, uh, uh, a detailed answer, as detailed as we can provide in order to address your, your question. I, uh, I hope it's definitive, and, and we haven't worked personally together, 
uh, just so many other people sitting in that seat uh, have, have, have failed to provide answers in the future. So I hope, uh, I hope you change, hope you restore my faith in that chair. Thank you. Mr. Jerry Connolly of Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome both, and welcome back, Mr. Sullivan. Um, Mr. Trackenberg, um, I'm following up on my colleague uh, and his concern that all too often we'll have to get back to you for the record <laughs> translates into deflection and not on your life and it will be gobbledygook if it's anything at all. You were asked by my colleague Karen Bass of California a reasonable question, how many troops do we have in Africa? Now there are published reports that say five to 6,000. Can you confirm that? And if not, is it classified? Uh, Congressman, the, the, the public number is uh, between five and 6,000. Uh, that's correct. Uh, I think my uh, earlier hesitation was based on the fact that I didn't want to get into specific numbers vis-a-vis uh, -vis specific countries. Okay. But, but you're exactly right on that issue. All right. So the range is accurate? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sullivan, um, I had the opportunity to talk about terrorism in the Maghreb at a speech I gave at CSIS this week. And it forced me to kind of think about, well, what are the elements we need in a counterterrorism strategy to be effective? And I was very gratified at your opening statement or your, uh, how you closed your testimony by saying, we believe that traditional counterterrorism efforts alone are not enough. Economic reform, good governance, and a respect for human rights must be prioritized. That was a very heartening thing to hear. And, um, uh, just if I can engage you a little bit on that, one of the things I really believe we've made a mistake on historically as a country, arguably for what we thought were better reasons, um, is that we ignore the need for pluralistic political space. Shah of Iran's a great example. So the Shah says, we, I don't want you talking about political opposition to our embassy, to our intelligence people, and we respect it. And as a result, you know, we haven't got a clue what's really going on in the country, and the only alternative to the authoritarian regime of the Shah is Khomeini and his crowd. And had maybe we had a little more elbow room and fortitude to uh, encourage other political expression, perhaps that wouldn't have been the only alternative. And I think we repeated that similar mistake during the Mubarak years in Egypt. And we're looking now at the Maghreb, we're looking at Africa, we're looking at a lot of strongmen governments. How do we avoid making the mistakes of the past? What do you agree that political pluralism is also part of that good governance we've just got to foster and encourage? Undoubtedly, it's a sign of strength of a society, of a culture. Uh, and I, I, you may not know this, I, I, if I, I was smiling when you described the Shah. My uncle, Bill Sullivan, was the last U.S. ambassador to Iran, so it may have been his failure uh, there. I apologize on behalf of my family if we weren't uh, yeah. doing as good a job as we should have been. I think it was really a U.S. failure, no one individual. And I think right. we were trying to respect a strong Absolutely. Uh, ally who was going to make the Persian Gulf, uh, you know. But we didn't see the Shia revolution that That's right. and the effect of it and how it spread. Exactly. And it, it's simply not in our interest to, frankly, um, honor those kinds of requests. So let's take Africa, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, any hopeful signs in this regard in terms of good governance, civ civil society, uh, political pluralism? Um, so two of the countries I went to, obviously mixed records, but not all bad. Tunisia, serious economic problems. They gotta get their economic house in order budget deficit, they need a lot of economic help. But their government, uh, their commitment to democracy, it's real. Nigeria, Buhari, the president, it's got health issues. There are, there are good prospects there, but there are challenges as well. Yeah. Parts of the government and the military, as you well know, where we've got issues. There are bright spots. There aren't a lot, but there are bright spots, and we need to encourage them. We need to show progress, and then we have precedents that we can cite to others. There's one other thing I, I mean, I talked about a number of things, but the other thing that I would highlight just for this purpose, I'm running out of time, and feel free, both of you, to comment, but I'll address it first to you, Mr. Sullivan. I worry that we don't seem to yet have our arms around the appeal 
on social media of the ISIS, Al-Qaeda, radical uh, narrative, it, it seems beyond us that anyone would be attracted to give up their whole lives and go fight and risk their lives and so forth, but they do in, in the thousands. And the only way to address that is to, A, uh, knock down the narrative convincingly and have an alternative narrative that is equally or maybe more attractive. I wonder if you could just comment on how well do you think we're doing? What do we need to do with respect to social media? And with that, Mr. Chairman, of course, I will give back my time. But I, I think it's a very important aspect of the counterterrorism fight. We're not doing well. Agreed. Um, we've established a global engagement center to try to address this issue. Um, we address it in two ways. There are, the mission's expanded. We haven't, it was originally established to address the issue you have raised for ISIS, Al-Qaeda, use of social media. As a result of what happened uh, with Russia and the impact in the election, it's now been expanded to state actors as well. So my concern is that we're broadening the mission of the Global Engagement Center when we really haven't gotten, uh, gotten it focused on the more limited but extremely important topic of uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, those terrorist organizations which are using social media to recruit uh, displaced, disadvantaged, disillusioned people. And I'd say, you said thousands, I'd say tens of thousands. Uh, serious problem. I defer to my, my colleague. Uh, no, Congressman, I, I would agree with everything uh, that uh, Secretary Sullivan has said. And, and in fact, uh, his citation of the Global Engagement Center, I think, is one of those areas where both the State Department and the Department of Defense have, have worked well and collaborated together, but I would agree more work is needed. Well, thank I, you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Connolly, and uh, Secretary Sullivan and Under Secretary Trockenberg for your testimony. As, as we've heard, uh, State and the Defense Department provide critical training, equipment, operational support for our partner forces in Africa. So coordination between your agencies is going to be critical to uh, success on these fronts, and our development is, uh, assistance is essential. Uh, the, the cost of our engagement on the continent in this battle against Islamists and other terrorism can be high. And we appreciate our servicemen and women and diplomatic personnel serving in very difficult and risky circumstances. But the threats are real and our national security demands that we don't ignore them. Uh, as a reference here, the comments made by my friend Mr. Connolly, he mentioned governance. Well, we have an election coming up in Liberia. It is critical that these elections be free and fair. We all understand the cost in the past uh, under Charles Taylor of what happened in Liberia and West Africa. Uh, and, uh, and now we have an opportunity to build on some measure of success. So uh, this uh, requires our engagement. And again, I thank you both, and the, the hearing is adjourned. Til aktuelt, kun aktuelt QFR.